you can't read the text, you're going to be you're going to have problems. So. Yeah, and make sure you're in a place where you can actually read the text. I'm not trying to hit. I'm just trying to hit. Most of it's definitely keeping patient here for the next. Yeah, I think I'm in. I'm also talking this way, so it may make more sense to be on that side. Just sit right across the Um, I think it's a good idea to I don't know. I got the cheese it's guys on the just Is the duos? Should we be opening up uh, the radio uh, one seventeen? Kind of it's not a big deal if you don't have it. I'm gonna go through and comment some stuff that's not commented and try to make it slightly cleaner while we're doing it. Um, I'm just kinda of giving some overview of what's happening. And how or what how we do our stuff. Yeah, mostly. Because some of this like we're not gonna talk about some stuff because like drive training this is gross, so we're just not gonna talk about it. because um, it's not gonna have it's not how we're doing it next year. So. Oh, drive train? Yeah, it's gross. Um, oh, how are we doing? We did, we'll clean some stuff up. But we just we, we took some stuff from the poops that we ended up not using, and it's just not worth it. Um, like gloves right now? Yeah. But it's not it's important to talk about because we're not using it. What's up? Can you excuse the charger? Okay, um, who else is supposed to be here? Not really well. Jack said he was coming, but he's probably not. So did Giant Olivia, but they're not here. Actually, the main class that we start working with. Um, everything on the robot is uh, basically extended from the WPI library. That's the stuff that actually interacts with the hardware, um, and they provide us methods that we're able to deal with and interact with. Um, so we're not like writing the entire operating system or anything like that. We basically extend iterative robot, which is the WPI class that basically allows you to say, what do you want to do in autonomous? What do you want to do in teleop? What do you want to do when it's disabled? And from there, you can figure out what your robot actually wants to do. Uh, we try not to have a ton of stuff actually in robot. We probably have more stuff this year than we've had in the past. But basically, this is largely initialization stuff that says, OK, how are we setting up everything that we're going to do with the robot? It doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, so extends iterative robot, so you guys know if you've gone through AP comp style, you should know what that means. Basically, it's, it allows it to take in everything that Aero has. Uh, anytime you're not sure where something is, if you right click and do open declaration, you can find where a, uh, a method is. So this is actually in the WPI class, or the WPI library. So we didn't actually write any of this. Um, this is all the stuff that's given to us. Uh, it's not incredibly important to know exactly what's happening here. Basically, all this does is say, if we're disabled, run disabled. If we're in teleop, run teleop. If we're in autonomous, run autonomous. Um, those are kind of the basic things that it needs to do. And then these methods are what we actually override to allow ourselves to do those things. So like this one is called the beginning of autonomous. So we override it when we extend it. We have our own autonomous knit. And so instead of saying, all, it, all this does is print out default iterative robot 
uh, autonomous init overload me, we overload it, um, and it makes sense. Uh, so it actually will run the code that we tell it to. It does the same things for the periodic command, so these are things that happen once every loop, so basically once every time we get controller feedback from the driver station. Uh, and then there's also, uh, they may not be here, but they exist somewhere. There's also ones that aren't periodic. Uh, what does it matter? Uh, we don't use them anymore. Does that mean robot base? Hmm? Would it be in robot base? Yeah, probably. It's even yeah. um, because there is something called simple robot, which some teams use, but simple robot's annoying because you don't even really get to like set your initializers. You like barely have an autonomous and tele -op. Like it's pretty rough. Um, <laughs> you definitely want to start with iterative if you want to do like anything useful on a robot. Um, okay, so the rest of our robot class, um, we start with. The logger that we didn't really use a whole lot of this year. We used it when we were testing the drivetrains the initial, at the start of the yeah, year. Yeah, the initial testing stuff we used it, but we need to get a better logger format so we can keep log data like from every match and make sure we have it so we can look at it easier. What is uh, logger? What is it? Say, what is it for? Uh, logger, it, it, it actually just logs, it'll log specific data that get, we want it, it to. It writes to a file on the Robo Rio, and in the logger class, you tell it what values to record by basically just adding them to a giant print statement. Yeah, so it, it's just printing, it, it's keeping a long list of everything we're, like you could log every motor value that we sent out during a match so we know what the motors are doing. Or, um, so we have some of that just on like the default driver station log, you get some amount of stuff, so you get like current to each port on the PB, some other things like that, but we could get it back from like the Talon, we could know exactly what the encoders are doing, we could know a lot of stuff if we have a better system for it, um, especially during the match, it's one of the things that should be on a list to work on for next year. Uh, you can just identify problems quicker. Uh, the debug flags is part of our debugger class. This comes in really handy in a lot if we do it well. If you set up your classes um, and you set up your, basically your print statements, we can just turn on and off these different strings or these different flags to say, okay, right now in our little debug window, we want to see only stuff about the gear intake and we can turn off the flags for everything else, and then we'll only get print statements about the gear intake, um, instead of seeing all like the drivetrain stuff all the time, if that's not what we're debugging. Uh, so we can just make new ones. So if we had some other subsystem next year, you would just type out the same public static final, string, name it whatever it is, we have a shooter, arm, whatever we have next year. Um, and then when we go and use those subsystems, you're able to refer to this very quickly as just robot.intake and that pulls up the same string every time. So you don't have to remember exactly what how the string is typed out. Uh, okay. The next thing we do in a robot is we create static instances of all of our subsystems and a lot of times some of our talent specifically. Uh, this is not necessarily the cleanest way to do it, but it works, so we do it this way. Uh, but basically, there's code that tells us what our drivetrain is, or there's code that tells us what our shooters are, or how our shooter wheels work. These are the places where we actually initiate them, or instantiate them at the beginning of, as the robot basically powers up. This is what we're, we're calling to make sure we have a single instance of it. So anywhere in the code, if we need to get to shooter wheel or shooter tower, it's just robot.shooter wheel or robot.shooter tower. We know where it is. Uh, there's other ways you could do it. There's probably cleaner, more object-oriented ways to actually do it. This way works for the robot. We only have one shooter wheel. We shouldn't be making a ton of instances of them all around, the, you know, everywhere. Because uh, that would just be strange. Uh, there's a few places where we want to get to a certain speed controller, so like we have its instance here too, so that if we needed to refer directly to the speed controller instead of going through the subsystem we could. Again, that's kind of a hack, because you're not really supposed to do things like that, but as long as you know what you're doing, it's fine. Uh, this isn't what you would do in like a really large like database program or something, if you're doing something where you're dealing with thousands of users, you might be able to break a bunch of stuff, you wouldn't want to do that. But on a single robot where you're in control of all the code and no one else is writing code for it largely, um, you know, outside of a small group of people who know what's on the robot, uh, you can get away with stuff like that and it makes it more convenient to do. 
Um, so yeah, so we just go through every system that we have. So there's shooter wheel, shooter tower, belt bed, climber, gear intake. Um, we have some stuff in here that doesn't exist anymore, right? So like gear spear isn't a thing, um, but it's still in the code. Um, backpack compressor, uh, that's our Navex, so we can get our heading. Um, there's some other stuff that are not really subsystems, but we just need to instantiate once, so we do it here. Spectrum preferences, so that's the whole list of stuff we have on the driver station that allows us to edit stuff and then remember all those settings. Um, so we instantiate it here once. Um, LEDs, headlights, um, the aiming light had its own subsystem at one point, it's still in there. And then the cameras have their own as well, so we can flip between them because all the stuff that handles the flipping code has its own subsystem that we call. Um, and weirdly, we have a single place where we do a current limit. I'm not entirely sure why that's in this part of the code, but whatever. Um, I think it's just because that's where we define some of the drive motors, and it's the easiest place to deal with it. Well, that would be kind of jittering, but that wouldn't be a reason well, why. Well, but if it killed die. one of the motors for some reason, remember we saw that cascading? But does it kill or does it we cap? Don't, I don't know. That's the question, right? <laughs> it should cap if it doesn't cap properly. And it killed one, it would cascade to the rest of them. We're, are we even setting it? I don't see it. Oh, uh, I think we are later on. Yeah. Oh, there we go. So this is the giant block of talent settings. Yeah, so this is basically all of our drivetrain talent configurations. Um, this probably could be simpler. It's really gross right now. But, but. it does its job. Um, basically, because each, each talent SRX has its own microcontroller, we're basically setting it up in the beginning to tell it exactly what we want it to do to the motors every time. Um, in theory, you only have to have it tell it once. Like it remembers all of its values too. So if we got rid of all of this, it would stay the same. Right. But, but you, you don't want to be sure, right? Because if we replace a Talon SRX, you want it to keep updating to the same settings. Yeah. Um, or if like you change a setting somewhere else, that and you don't clean up afterwards. Right. This so makes sure that it gets set properly at the start of the match. Yeah. So this re in in initiates everything from the start of the match. So we have things like um, the control mode for Talon one. And Talon two, oh no, so this, yeah, so this is Talon one and two, and this one should be. Well, so yeah, the so left is block left, is the top. The right block is all right, right, and left has a little bit more because left has an encoder on it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So in theory, we should have encoder on both sides, which we'll do for next year. Um, so it'll make it drive a little bit better. We have a little bit more control of it during auto, at least. Uh, um, things that we have it set to. Uh, Enable brake mode um, so that we have a little bit more control of the driving and can stop short. It doesn't just coast everywhere. Um, and then you'll see things like reverse output, which uh, has to do with making sure that when we give it, say, positive voltage, it goes forward. Um, and that that can be consistent across all of the motors because the other side of the drivetrain is backwards. Right. Um, so this one, well, so this side is actually the backward one, right? Because this is reverse output. Um, so this is the backward one, so this is reverse output true. Um, reverse sensor false would just mean if the sensor was turning the opposite way, if like, the sensor thought forward was backwards, but it's not. So you can flip the sensor too. Uh, there's a lot of little settings like that that you basically have to toy with to get it right before you actually go ahead and do any of the commands. So Because right. you don't want to be telling your motors, give it, give it positive voltage if I want to be spinning negative, because that's just silly and you're never going to remember that. Yeah, so it makes sure that you can always have forward be forward and encoder be in the right direction. It, it handles all that once you once you set it up and test it. Uh, peak output and nominal output, um, those just clean up some stuff so that it, you can't, in theory, give it certain values. So if we wanted to nerf the robot and make it so it couldn't Drive do very fast, right? we could just change these values and make it so it can never have more than 8 volts out or 10 volts out or anything. Uh, so you can configure peak output voltage. So that, we do it on the we do it on things like the gear intake and stuff. So we don't want the gear intake going super fast ever, like on the gear intake arm. 
Um, so we have it set to where it can't go above a certain voltage. Um, nominal output voltages are just ones where basically says below this value, don't even try to send anything because we know it can't move. Um, so it never tries to give anything less than one volt. That's probably too low because it can't even move at one volt. Um, but at least can't even move at like four volts. Right. Really? But we at least know it's not trying to give it 0.25 randomly and just like move the talent, move the talent for no reason. Because um, the system just won't move at that speed. Um, Wait, so in the config nominal output voltage commands, mm -hmm. the string, like the DA colon plus nominal, like oh, what is that? Gotcha. Good That's question. the very good question. Okay, so robot.prefs.git number colon DA colon plus peak voltage colon comma <laughs> plus 12F. All right, so breaking this down. So this is robot.prefs. So like I said, up here we make a new instance of spectrum prefs prefs, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so in what we have here is basically it sets up so that in smart dashboard, we're able to see the value and edit it. So by instantiating this once here, we can just change it on the dashboard without having to change it in code. And uh, the, the, the string is the, the tag that it's looking for, because yeah. we have you know it's dozens of values in there. Yeah, it's the key for it. So the formula with the, the, uh, the system we've been using to be able to tag stuff is you have some letter that means something ahead of it. So DA is drivetrain auto. Uh, they got more complicated as see the one on Like you did like out. one A because there's stuff that you want at the top. Yeah, and one, one is, is just, just the first thing that comes up. <laughs> yeah, one A is just because you sort my name, so it just goes up to the top. Uh, <laughs> and like there's stuff like you want like a bunch of A stuff, there's a bunch of shooter stuff, so it's S. Um, like in place turn IPT. Yeah, there's yeah, some stuff is kind of weirdly placed, but it all gets in there. And then the reason it's get number is that we built up preferences, which I'll get to in a second, but basically get numbers checks if it exists. If it already exists, it just um, it doesn't do anything, basically. If it doesn't exist, it adds it already. Um, and then it will actually return the value of whatever this is. And the plus 12F is just the default. So if it doesn't exist, it sets it to plus 12F. If it does exist, it pulls it from the preferences table. Uh, the preferences table is stored on the RoboRio, so even when you power down, your preferences are saved. When you load it back up, um, they're still there. Um, which is both good and bad. The good is that it's saved and it's forever there. However, if I wanted to change it, I can't change it without the robot being on. So if I change this plus 12F right now, it does nothing because it's already on the robot and it has some value and that value overrides this. Yeah. Um, so I have to change that on the preferences. Um, or if you're, if you're fiddling around with it and you freak, like if you're tuning a PID loop and you have something that kind of sort of works, but then you start tuning it and then you completely break it, if you didn't record your original value somewhere, you, you're, there's yeah, nothing there. Yeah. Because it's just stored on the river. It's not in code anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but it is more useful to use those, because then we can tune them without having to go into code and re-download right. anything, right? You can just do it really fast. Um, um, nominal closed loop voltage is, uh, what is that? Nominal closed loop voltage is the max you can give it in closed loop. The talents have really weird naming conventions, and you basically have to have the reference manual open at all times when you're dealing with talent stuff. Um, because stuff will be named. Because it just, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. What's a closed loop? Closed loop is when we're commanding it based on sensor values. So, so like, it's, the it's whether or not the, so open loop is where the loop is sort of like open to the world, and you can feed it inputs, right? So that's what we okay. do when we're driving. Closed loop is where the, the control loop is closed to the outside world. It's and you oh, don't okay. give it any information aside from the sensors that it's attached to. Okay. Yeah, so it's getting when, feedback. You would use closed loop when we're doing like autonomous. Right. Well, yeah, so closed loop is when we're doing PID motion control ID. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is, this. the Talon SRX software reference manual is on the CTRU website. I think it's on the VEX website too. But this is, if you're going to program for the robot, this is like your best friend and most mm -hmm. annoying. It's 174 courses. pages and it looks really long, but there's a table of contents and that you, kind of helps yeah, you sometimes. Kind of search sometimes <laughs> and you just like figure out what things are, right? So we said, what is it? Set, nominal, closed loop. Closed. Should come All right. So set, nominal, closed loop voltage, and it'll tell you what it is up here somewhere. Closed loop, nominal battery voltage. And then you read this whole chapter and then you figure out what it is. <laughs> 
Suppose it is compensated for the measured battery voltage. Uh, So basically, basically this says pretend the battery is at this voltage always. Yeah. Uh, and give this proportion and give proportions of this number as opposed to proportions of whatever the battery is at. So you're basically saying this is the top of the battery voltage, right? So in there, I think we end up changing it later, but currently it's set to seven. I think I should change it in auto later on, so this doesn't do anything. Yeah, there's, there's like a preference but, that we change in the panel. Yeah, it, it's, it's changed somewhere else, but this got left here. It doesn't matter, it initiates to this, and then we change it again somewhere else. Um, which is not, again, not good. It should have been cleaned. Uh, but I'm almost certain it's not seven, because seven is pretty low, and I think we're going to last on that. Um, Set allowable closed loop error is also, I'm almost certain, it doesn't matter here because I'm almost certain I said it later. Uh, yeah, because I'm pretty sure this is encoder text, but then we right. definitely just use inches later. Five is crazy small. Um, so this is basically where it decides, is done, like, is it finished? Like, it just, if, if we're within a certain amount of error, right, so if, if the encoder is close enough to whatever we tell it to be at, it just stops trying to move anymore. Um, I'm pretty sure that is encoder text too. So five encoder text is one. On those, it's one. Uh, five, one twenty fourth of a rotation, because there's a hundred twenty tick. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, tiny. Um, so within like two thirtieth. Uh, something, something tiny, right? Something so small that it doesn't matter and that value doesn't really do anything. Because um, we're never gonna hit that with our current system. And I'm pretty sure again we change it later in auto somewhere. Um, so it shouldn't be there, but it was written there at some point and never deleted. Uh, and we just fixed it later. Uh, the talent has two different profiles you can run. So if for some reason you had uh, like two specific shooter settings you wanted to use, you could have a profile zero and a profile one. Instead of having to send all the PID commands to it or the preferences to it each time to like configure them, you would tell it to be in profile zero and then be in profile one. Uh, we've never done it that way. It takes milliseconds to send the four or five commands you need to configure it back to a different PID value. Um, so we just always send the full PID commands, right? Like these four can commands are so fast you would never notice they're happening. Uh, these are places where we are setting our uh, PID commands for motion magic, which is a whole other chapter of this giant thing, which if we want to start doing autonomous code, we need to read, but basically it's how we do all of our drive stuff is motion magic. Um, this is some more of that, some more talent configuration stuff. Um, these ones set the other two talons on the drivetrain to just follow the first one. So left drive talon two and left drive talon three are set to follow our mode. Then we set them to follow talon one dot get device ID. So whatever talon one is, they're set to always output the same thing as talon one. And if you if you scroll to where we set up the climber, we do the same thing but we have to double check that because all four motors are running at the same time. Um, which is useful if, we're just, if you're actually using just the generic substance without creating one yourself. Um, all right, so these are a couple different constructors you could use. If it's a double solenoid, you have an extend and a retract. If it's a single solenoid, you just have an extend. Um, which in theory could also be retract. It just kind of depends on what you want the default state of it to be, but for our purposes, it's extend. Um, in the commands, you could set it up in hardware differently if you really needed to. Um, I mean, I had to, I had, because I have three, if you look at gear backpack, there's three. Well, yeah, yeah. You, you couldn't do it so. in gear backpack, yeah. yeah. You it would have to be for other, it would have to be for something. There's, more, there's, like, more there's a couple ones, yeah, there's a couple ones where I've got it where it was like super quick and I just needed to test something or something and do it that way. Um, I think I started headlight that way with Spectrum with one of the other ones. Um, oh yeah, so then you have, in your subsystem, you always have methods that you're able to call. So this is how you actually command something. So like in this really basic one, you'd have an extend method, which checks, um, which sets it to true if it's a double, it retracts it, uh, and then it 
This should actually be backwards. Why is it? That's weird. This should be backwards. Okay. Because it, it should tell retract to be false and then extend to be true just to make sure it actually happens that way. Because otherwise, you could, in theory, have them both set to extend, which would, or. I mean, it happens. Yeah, it happens so like, fast, but it still it shouldn't. Like, it should be the other way. Um, And then we have a debugger.print line. So you can see here, like, if the output is, if the flag output is on and we're set to info three, it would tell you the name of the subsystem and that it's extended, or it would tell you the name of the subsystem and it's retracted in the print statement. Uh, and then there's a helper method here that basically just says, are you extended or not? And you can get the state of the solenoid subsystem. Uh, Currently, we don't have anything that simple on the robot, but if we added something like a, uh, I don't know, brake system we could put in there. Well, we, like brakes, we, we just put in drive. Yeah, we have brakes in drive so that they're all packaged together, but if we had it something that was its own little pneumatic piston for something, you could make one. Um, like, like in gear theory, gear sphere should have been. Oh, oh it, it was. Oh, that's the one oh, I hey. <laughs> ah, I knew I did one of them. All right, so gear sphere just extends solenoid subsystem, so I don't have to write nearly as much code for it. Um, because all I had to write was toggle, basically. So everything else that I just talked about <laughs> was able to be controlled with gear sphere. All I did was make a toggle function that wasn't Which already even in. even theoretically should be in. So Probably. Um, and then I didn't have to write any other code because it was already in the default stuff. Um, we don't use gear sphere anymore, but that was an example of being able to be way faster because we already had some default code written for it. Uh, what is a subsystem controller? What do you mean? Uh, the, the package will load. Uh, we do that. Uh, uh, good question. This is all random stuff from the poofs that we don't use. Okay. Which uh, <laughs> way, none of it exists in Spectrum default. Because I mean, yeah, we deleted all that. Oh, okay. It's all poofs code that we don't use. Um, I mean, but it wouldn't make sense if I was to do like an LED controller to put it in like the substance of the Or is that not what's used? No, because LEDs already have a subsystem, right? Okay. So yeah. there's a subsystem already for LEDs. Yeah. So this subsystem for LEDs tells it, any, any subsystem is basically how you map your hardware, right? So yeah. it needs to map to some physical thing on the robot. Uh, in this case, it maps to the LEDs. So it says, okay, how are we talking to the LEDs? We're talking to it over ITC. Yes. Yeah, um, theory, your controller would actually be a, a command. Right, so it's just the command talking to the subsystem. So we also have some methods in here that already tell it what colors. So if we want to like change how to do the different colors, we would change what numbers to send. Um, there's also one that we haven't talked about, which is default command, which is basically if there's nothing, if there's nothing already talking to a subsystem, it'll just run whatever the default command is. Um, so like for the drivetrain, the default command is whatever arcade drive, whatever thing that allows the driver to actually move the robot. Because we, we want to make sure that if, for some reason, we forget to call a command, you're always able to drive the robot. Uh, so for the lights, if nothing else is running, it defaults to purple. But um, eventually we're going to be moving towards, like, the, we have a single command. Right. right, so we would change the set default command to the new the command that's always right. running, the, yeah, the light controller like, command that's always running. Yeah. Um, and then that command, the light controller command would probably have some methods in it that we would be able to call. And it gets a little weird because it's not exactly as nice as command base should be, but it makes it easier than what we're doing. Because we just basically we need something to be running to be able to do the timing, and we don't have a way to do that right now. Uh, okay, so in a little bit more complicated subsystem, we have Climber, which doesn't have a whole lot in it either. Um, so Climber basically it takes in the motors for the Climber. Um, we have a set command. So if the value is not zero, um, set the voltage ramp rate to current limit. Oh yeah, I remember this. So, so this is a very important. This is very, oh, this yeah. is a very important line of code. This is where we were breaking down because I didn't uh, have this bit of code. Let's us stop. Um, the time. <laughs> Okay, so when we first added this code, oh uh, Elaine couldn't stop very fast. 
So she would just like so, stop when you were expecting to. Yeah, and then so hit you the let death. go and it would keep going. True. Uh, that's climbing. because set voltage ram prey would make it so that it can't just go from like full voltage to zero immediately. Right, because ideally what we wanted to do was that we didn't want it to climb too fast because it was breaking through the Velcro basically. Um, mm -hmm. So we set a ramp rate so that it had to take a little bit of time to speed up. Um, it also meant that it took time to speed, slow, down. slow down, which was a problem which I did not realize. Um, and so now when you set it to zero, it we'll let it just immediately stop. So now once it's set to zero, um, clears the voltage ramp rate um, when you are stopping, which is very important. Not a lot of code, but fixed a very major problem. <laughs> Because Elaine was super confused why she couldn't stop the robot from climbing. Uh, and it also climbed. took like five people to get the robot off. Oh yeah, that's was Because <laughs> uh, we got very much locked to the dev. How many matches did it take for us to figure that out? It was only a practice match. It was, it was like once on the real field and two times on the practice field. The practice field one was the worst. Because oh. um, where we broke the camera too. Right? Yes. Alright, <laughs> um, yeah, so... We used the bathroom. Yeah, that's right. So then the... Let's see. So the get speed method is just like a helper function to say, hey, how fast is the timer working? I have no idea if we ever call it, but things like that, you should basically always write into your subsystems in case you need them. Um, because then you can do things, because um, once you have it, you can do things like robot dot, what does it not have robot in it? Oh. You want to not just crash? <laughs> there we go. Robot dot climber dot, and then because of autocomplete, you can very quickly see every method that you have access to. Um, so if for some reason you needed to get the current speed of the climber, you have it ready to go, you can just do get speed, and it's there, and now it's calling itself, and it's just weird, but uh, we don't need recursive helper methods, that'd be bad. Uh, <laughs> we are always checking the speed. Um, yeah, that would be bad. Uh, wouldn't, that, right. wouldn't that just immediately freeze? Yeah, it'd be very, yeah. very important, because there's no way for that recursion to never end. Um, infinite recursion is bad, you'll learn about that. You should have learned about that in AP, I think, but I don't know if you actually did, but you will learn about <laughs> it's, that it's, in it's, your in first... It's in the same vein as while true. You'll, you'll learn about your first OP, like, actual object-oriented um, class. Um, oh, OO class. Yeah, we didn't really touch recursion in comp sci, AP comp sci. Oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> um, <laughs> recursion is a Recursion in general is very bad on robots, very useful on actual computer applications, very bad on robots. Um, there's a few times where you could do it in robots. And it was like for like, like very quick things. Yeah. But recursion is basically when a method calls itself. Yeah. Um, and then it has an exit way. Like yeah. If you don't have an exit way, then it just Very, yeah. Wow. Very, very useful in robot, in computer programming. Incredibly useful in computer programming. Incredibly terrifying in robot robots. programming. Because uh, you end up, anytime you're halting the loop and it can't get feedback from the joystick, is a bad thing. Um, uh, mm. Get current just does the current, and then we also have disable, which um, just completely disables the motor. It just turns off the motor controllers. Uh, which we don't necessarily want to do ever. Um, is climbing checks if. Um, the climber motors are moving at all, they're just anything above zero, um, and it checks if we're climbing. I don't know if we ever used that either, but it exists. Um, you can check. You can check all yeah, that. I know, but it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so, so, so uh, certain parts of the subsystems are super easy, like there's nothing complicated in climber really. Um, there's a little bit more complicated in the command itself, but nothing really. Um, um, very bare bones. Yeah, example subsystem <laughs> is missing some of its. Uh, oh, no, I think that's all it's supposed to have. Yeah, example subsystem is there. Example command has more. Example subsystem doesn't have much in there. But basically, if you forgot how to make a subsystem and you need to like copy and paste something, you can go to example subsystem and copy and paste it. Uh, that's basically what it's for. Uh, gear intake probably has a little bit more. Yeah, so it has to have an intake motor and an arm motor. Uh, it has a value that it saves for the up position. Mm -hmm. It actually it sets its feedback device, so it sets the um, CTRE mag encoder absolute. So here we're using an absolute mag encoder um, instead of like the quadrature encoder that just has like all it knows is turns. This actually knows exactly where around the circle it is. 
and that's the versus planetary encoder is this thing. Um, you can also use CTRE encoder dot something else. What's the other one? Um, relative, which basically just gives you like speed, like a regular one. The absolute gives us um, actual position, which is what we want for the arm, because we're not doing a bunch of revolutions or anything. Um, okay, so in here you can see that we can fig the peak out voltage to plus or minus six volts, so we can't ever give it more than like half voltage to the arm, because we don't want to break anything. Um, mm, those ramp rates should actually just be, oh no, the vo voltage ramp rate should actually be zero. We got them both to be max. No. But yeah, but now the voltage ramp rate we can put to zero. Yeah, you can because zero is what max. Zero is zero. Is also I mean, that's also infinite. Mm -hmm. But well, no, because no, that's more than it's. That's practically infinite because it's correct. more than it's ever going to need. Yes. But zero is actually correct. Don't set this. Give it no ramp uh, or okay. infinite ramp. Agreed. But ten thousand volts per second or whatever it is. is also Way faster infinite. than. Yeah. It's also <laughs> <laughs> for the robot that is infinite. It can't update faster than that. Therefore, it's above its max. Um, we change the control mode to be position, so we're telling it we're actually going to move it in position mode um, for the arm talon specifically. All that's for the arm talon. Uh, it doesn't have a default command, so like if nothing is called right now, it can just stop moving, which or it can just stop being commanded and just have everything be floating. Um, it's not necessarily the best thing, it causes some issues, but it, it's better than having it break itself if like it had a default command of like wanting to stay up and we got into some bad state. We don't want it to do something bad and break itself. Um, we'd rather just kind of float and be compliant. Uh, here's how we actually set the arm motor. Um, this is setting it to a certain speed directly. These are just some git, so we can call back the, you can basically just return the speed controllers directly from here if you want to. Um, yeah, most of this isn't super useful actually. Subsystems people want to look at? Uh, drive and, or shooter wheel will have PID, drive will have motion magic. We shouldn't touch drive because drive is first. Um, drive doesn't even have motion magic. Oh, it doesn't? In, it's oh, it's only commands. Yeah. Drive, drive. So shooter wheel should drive have is, some. Right, drive is so ugly we shouldn't look at it. Um, shooter wheel should have some PID stuff in it, if I remember correctly. The next one is better. Um, what else is there? Wheel. Oh, shooter wheel does, yeah. yeah. Is there something we're going to base off our drive of next year? Yeah, the new one. Cause we, I, oh, we, I cleaned it up. Cleaned I cleaned out, out all the extra yeah, old closed loop stuff from before Talon SRXs. Or Motion Magic, yeah. Oh, what is Motion Magic? It's the stuff on the Talon SRX. It just lets it do. It's a better form of PID, basically. Do they need it, Motion Magic? Yes. It imitates motion profiling without having to do a bunch of. Oh, okay. But that's more advanced than we need to go into right now. Um, but it's, it's basically how we do drive forward stuff and mm -hmm. actually hit our marks. But most of the time, funny except for yeah, um, Okay, yeah, so shooter wheel subsystem does define stuff like um, ways to set the PID on the Talon so we can configure the different um, variables here. Um, we do most of it in the command itself or in setup. Um, Um, there's some different little, most of these are really tiny things that aren't hard to write, we just have to remember to do them. So like adjust speed, it takes in a single value that's the adjustment, and then you basically just do, um, then it calls the speed adjust variable that we have written up here, and adds to the adjustment. Um, it adds itself, or adds the adjustment to it. So then if we needed to like adjust the speed based on a little bit, we have it set on the D-pad still. I'm pretty sure it still works at some point. It possibly. Um, <laughs> I don't know the last time we tested it, but at some point it worked that we could up the speed a little bit on the D-pad or decrement it on the D-pad. Um, 
using the adjustment code. Um, and so, and it held it to, so no matter what we set the speed to, it would always keep the adjustment adding to it. Um, there's a clear adjustment, so if we want to get rid of the whatever we're adding to it, we can set it to zero quickly. Um, some more little helper methods for like get speed, get the current set point, so like that's basically what speed we're setting it to. Um, this is the actual speed it's going. Um, we calculate our own error, because the talent SRX error is kind of weird sometimes. Um, so error is the difference between where we want it to be and where it's actually, so get set point minus get speed. Um, um, current. The current of the motor, we set whether it's inverted. We can enable and disable the entire talon and basically tell it to stop moving. Um, uh, I don't think we use on target right now. I, I think it gets, no, no, it gets called um, in dashboard. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, basically, this just checks basically if we have a green light for whether the speed is at the right spot on the dashboard. Um, Which it's, it's there. I don't think we ever actually use it. Yeah, we it's don't. There. It's there. I think it's probably even set to like a true false, not actually a, a colored box on the dashboard. Yeah, it's supposed to be a colored box at some point, but it probably isn't. Um, but yeah, this was supposed to show you basically you wouldn't want to like run the belt bed and fireballs if the on target mm -hmm. light wasn't on. Um, so this code would be it would be much more helpful if we once we start going into being able to shoot a tele app not an auto. In auto it checks all that stuff by itself. Uh, this is we use the same method for the shooter wheel and for the shooter tower, since they both have to be speed, speed controlled. Yeah. Well it's uh, it's the same class and then they just get handled differently in shooter on and tower on. Yeah. So actually if we want to look at those. Um, okay. Or Does anyone want to talk about any other subsystems briefly? Oh, yeah. It doesn't matter. Like subsystems are all pretty simple. Um, like the entire gear backpack subsystem is just here's a bunch of solenoids, and set them to true or false <laughs> depending on what you want to be doing. Like that's literally all it is. Is like it's okay. Six. <laughs> six solenoid. Fun methods and then two sensor methods, Maybe or no, even one score? sensor method. One sensor method, yeah. It says, hey, do, <laughs> is, is, uh, did we score? Is the little button pressed? Um, do you want the flap down, up? Like, where do you want stuff? And that's all it is. Solenoids can only be uh, activated and deactivated, right? Solenoids. Yeah, you have yeah. you have a one or zero. On or off. Right, and you have one or zero on both sides if they're doubles. If it's a double, so. But these aren't even all of these are. These are all singles, singles, so I just didn't even bother. Right. Every single one is sent to a single, so that it all it defaults to a certain state. When power's not on. And then that, oh. that last gear deploy stuff is, uh, at IRI, we were, when we were doing some stuff with the, uh, the spring sensor, we noticed that like it would just start twitching if you held down the pad. So basically, there's some back-end code in that in auto to make sure that it only activates it. Basically, you can't activate the gear pad twice within one second, yeah. is how it's currently coded. Are we gonna show we map buttons? Yeah, yes. yeah, we'll get there in oh, just okay. a second. Okay, because if you don't have, if you don't know what a subsystem is, though, you can't. Or a command. What commands a command are also important. Um, yeah, because we have to go through commands next briefly. We're not gonna go through all the commands. Commands get more complicated, but a couple of them will be helpful. So commands are basically what the things that actually do stuff to the subsystem. Basically, everything we've done so far has just. Then interfacing set with up the all the yeah so set up all the hardware right so back to the very beginning where we had like the hardware dot whatever and like literally the port numbers then we have set up subsystems which goes through and calls all those things and kind of builds our map of where everything is um, and then the commands are what actually start interacting with everything and actually allowing the driver to do stuff allowing auto to do anything like we basically in auto all we're doing is calling commands and all the buttons do are call commands everything gets done in the commands. Um, so down to the most basic of stuff to like vibrate controller. <laughs> that is one of our commands. Um, it takes in a Xbox controller, a duration, and an intensity. Um, it initializes by setting the rumble on both sides of that Xbox controller and to be that much. It starts a timer. Um, it tells you it's vibrating the controller at debug on robot.general. So you can see that it's vibrating. <laughs> 
Uh, well, why do we have the controller vibrate? Uh, feedback for the drivers. Oh. Um, um, so like when I think the one I know one of the ones that's used is shooter on and uh, gear intake done. Yeah, gear intake. I don't think we have it on for shooter anymore. But yeah. We no, if you turn the shooter on, it definitely rumbles. I'm oh, oh, no, no. So is it the shooter itself? Okay. Yeah. It should. Oh, when well, the shooter light the shooter is green, itself. it should also be rumbling. Okay. I'm pretty sure. It's so, relatively light on your controller. Mostly. So for commands, we always have to do the initialize, execute. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so that's basically the. the, the oh, and, is it, and interrupted. That's an yeah. important one, too. Library control. So like you have an initialize, you initialize it like normal, like you have your constructor. Then you have, there's an initialize method. Um, Figuring out what goes in the constructor and what goes in initialize is interesting. So your constructor is called at the beginning of like the robot, right? Like you build a command possibly once at the As soon as OI gets built, basically. Maybe, yeah, most of the time, um, right? So it's whenever you do new vibrate constructor, you, you create a new instance of that class, right? right. That's when it gets called. Initialize gets called every time the command is run. They seem similar, and a lot, oftentimes one of our most annoying problems that we find is that we do something in the constructor that should be done in initialize. Um, so in general, move it to initialize if you can, basically. <laughs> All right. um, so we should only be using the constructor to like store variables. Yeah, like that. That's about every. Those have to happen, right? It's so like you, you're building a thing, you're storing the variable that goes up here. But for the um, rest, we should just start. If, if everything else is in initialize, you're better off, um, because what will end up happening is, especially the biggest problem is you'll end up doing stuff with the, um, like the preferences table or something, and you'll do it in the constructor. But that happens once. So if you update it in the preferences table and the robot's running, it'll never see it'll, it it'll never because happen. it constructed it once. The initialize happens every time the command. Is um, every every time the command is started. Started, sorry. Yeah. Which, yeah, not every time. It's not every time it's executing through its loop. Um, that's what execute. What's the difference between start and execute? So initialize happens once the command is one time when the command starts, right? Yeah. Execute happens every time through the loop. All right. We need them to all turn the drum the same way, but two of the motors are facing in different or are like or oriented opposite to the other two. So you'll see we have to use another uh, method. Let's see, where is it? Oh, there we go, there we go. We need to use reverse output because, so they're all, they're all cloning to the same first climber talon, but they need to clone it and then flip the output from it. Because if they were all spinning clockwise, it would seize up. So we need two of them to spin clockwise and two of them to spin counterclockwise. Yeah, so we make the... We make the climber left talon the one that we'll actually use. So climber left talon um, is the one that we actually tell everything to. It gets it gets into the climber method eventually. Um, we set it to be however we want it to work, and then from there we set the rest of it. Um, each one of them. Uh, uh, we give them the same voltage rate limit stuff like that. They're all in break mode. And then we actually set up the left and right drives so that we're able to command them later. So that's where we actually, the commands are where we actually command everything. So I just and said, all of this is just set up code. Right. None of this does anything. And those Spectrum Speed Controller cans are what we use to control blocks, or basically just to, to group blocks of talents together. So the only one we ever actually interact with is that first one on the list, right? Mm -hmm. The other two are just slaved to it. Yeah, but what it allows us to do is we can say git. Right. Uh, spec, we can say get left drive current, and it gives us the combined current of all three, because right. like it, it knows they all exist. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also, it's how we, we keep track of the PDP slots, mm -hmm. uh, and at which town they're paired to. So we can do Spectrum Speed Controller, you know, get can talon one, which will be the middle one, and you know, get uh, PDP one, which will be the middle one. And so we can uh, just keep track of all of those in one place without having to go to you know, six different locations for them. Yeah, so, and for all of them, we set up to where you, we know what PDP slot each talent is set up to, so we can get the current off the PDP for which motor. And talons themselves do it too, um, but it's useful to have both options, um, especially if we have a motor controller that's not a talent after X. And at this point, it might be kind of broken, because I feel like we've just rewired that thing so many times and uh, changed can No, ideas. we shouldn't have. Shouldn't have? Well, that should be right. Okay. Almost certain all that's right. Uh, yeah, because we definitely never rewired the... Rewiring the PDP would have been weird. 
No, we, we like shuffled a lot of canned talents around and we redid. Not the drivetrain, though. Not the drivetrain. Okay, not the drivetrain. There's no way we use the drivetrain. Because those have to be on the same spots. Uh, I don't think we moved everything. Most are all. We did, we did invert drivetrain at one point, though. Hmm? To where, because it, it, it used to be like top, to front, back, now it's like back, front. Mm, I'm pretty sure that's still right, though. I'm pretty sure. Um, but yeah, we, it doesn't matter either way. It's working. Um, all right, so we talked about climber. We basically do that for all of our subsystems. Um, anything in there is different. Um, oh, we didn't mention this too fast, but so with the hand talent, you have to tell it what feedback device is plugged into it. So like for the shooter in the tower, we have quad encoders plugged in. In theory, you could have, so those are telling us speed. You could have things like potentiometers, which tell you position, or an absolute encoder, which tells you position. Um, and that just tells it how to interpret the signal that it's getting into its data port. Yeah. Um, uh, and configure encoder codes per rev. Again, one of the stupid terms that's from the Talon SRX manual. Um, tells you basically how many ticks per um, revolution you get on the wheel. So for every every revolution we have on the shooter wheel or on the tower, it gives three ticks. Which, which is which isn't actually true is. because we. No, it is true. No, it is true. That, that was true. It was done before. Remember, it was we were confusing what it was telling us because it was like, oh, it's six, but it's not actually six. Oh, right. so only three because it was like multiplying by a weird number and doing all sorts of weird stuff. Um, um, okay, yeah. So we set up the belt bed. We set up uh, shooter remote. <laughs> all those things get set up and get ready to run. Um, Gear where we're actually calling the subsystem. So like this gear backpack, new gear backpack, we're passing in where the solenoids are for it. So like the gear backpack has a and there's two flaps in the doors. Right. So it has the backpack solenoid where we actually deploy it. It has the gear flap. It has the ball flap, and it has the spring sensor. Right. So we pass in all those things to our subsystem that we create, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, so it knows where everything is. Um, some of these things are generic, so like spectrum solenoid, we can just create spectrum solenoid based on what port they are. Um, we haven't talked about hardware yet, so I'll do that right now. But basically, we have a big hardware map. The HW file is hardware, and that's where we map everything to ports on the Roborio or CAN IDs or any of that stuff. Um, so it starts with like having the driver gamepad and the operator gamepad are in there. Um, so we need to access those. It's just hardware gamepad. And then we can pull buttons, we can pull whatever we need out of it. Uh, all the PDP slots are mapped here. Uh, all the CAN motor assignments are mapped here. Uh, the digital sensors are mapped here. Uh, one of those should have an output on it, and we never did. It that one's missing one of its things, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the different solenoids are mapped, so like, we know where the gear spear and the gear backpack and ball flaps and everything are. Um, clearly some of them don't exist anymore, but that's fine. Uh, if we had analog inputs, we'd have um, USB port zero and stuff like that are useful for the game pads, but it's not super important. Uh, so if we need to change anything, like we're moving something, we change it in hardware and then it just auto updates everywhere that we'd possibly call it. Um, which for the most part is just in robot. Uh, there's a few other places it could be. Um, but it, even if it is only in robot, it puts it in one. It puts all of them in one place. Right. So, so we don't have to hunt them down. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you'd have to hunt through all of robot and you're going to find it, and that's just annoying. Uh, okay. So uh, this guy you'll see every once in a while, the try catch block. Basically, if for some reason. We didn't, like if we tried to run the robot and we didn't have the Navex installed and the Navex got broken, if we didn't have this try catch, the robot code would just stop because it threw an exception and it was uncaught. So then it would just be like, nope, I'm done. Bye. I can't do what um, you've asked me to do. Right. I don't care. I can't move on. So this block right here, this try catch says, okay, make a new Navex. Say, hey, like an in, in, initiate the Navex. It's on the SPI port on the MXP. That's what it's plugged into. Um, if that works, set Navex ready to true. So we can check if the Navex is actually there. If it doesn't work, catch the runtime exception. 
um, it'll put out a driver station error, so it'll report on like a little error window in the driver station saying um, error initiating navx, blah, 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 um, and then it'll set it to false. So then anytime we want to use the navx throughout our code, we have to check that navx ready boolean. Which I'm pretty sure we don't. Yeah, we do. At the beginning of auto, yeah, we do. Oh, okay. Um, because if we don't, and the navx got unplugged, it would do bad things, and it would try to reference something that was uninitiated, and then you'd get a null pointer, and it'd be bad. And you'd basically be like, hey, I want to get an angle from a navx, and it's like, I don't have anything at navx, I this failed. Uh, and then your robot code would crash, and then our, we'd have to like reboot robot code in, in teleop and just get that way. Uh, so we want to avoid things where the robot just dies in the middle of the field. Um, and that would be a case where it would if for some reason the navx wasn't plugged in because of the way it, the code works for it. Um, um, these are some standard stuff that we don't really reference in a lot of places, but they're mostly code from people, other people we took, but you, it's useful to have around. Um, so we can get stuff like the robot state for disabled autonomous tele Um Okay, so all of that, like I said, was just kind of our initial um, set up subsystems. It's a method that we call set up subsystems, and it's how everything, all the hardware gets defined basically in the robot and where it goes is right there. That is actually not called until we get to robot init, which is run once at the beginning of the robot code. Robot init is run. Um, it's the only time to run as soon as robot's powered on. Um, we init debugger, which is down here. We'll get to in a second. Um, we tell it that we started. Um, we set up the subsystems, which is all that stuff we just went through. Um, we make a new OI, which is very important to do after set up subsystems. Um, that is a very simple way to break everything. Operator oh, interface. Operator interface is basically all of the button mapping. Um, Every button that has to go somewhere, where does it? What does it do? Um, so and it needs all the subsystems to exist already. If okay. the subsystems don't exist, you're telling it to like call things that don't exist yet, and it gets very mad at you, and everything breaks. Um, so that order is super important. Um, so this has to be before the OI is created in the next line. Read my comments there. <laughs> Screw that up. Nothing works. Um, Initialize dashboard is where we set all of the dashboard values that aren't the preferences. Uh, Which is mostly stuff that we just need to read and not ever actually interact with. Yeah, now that's kind of basically how it works. So like y'all rate is there. Um, there's some shooter wheel stuff in there that if we, we can uncomment and put back on there if we want. Like so most of the time it's off. Um, you don't want a ton of stuff in this because it does slow. Um, Communication. It does, yeah, it does send a lot of stuff back and forth to the robot. And if you have too much, it'll slow down the robot review. Um, so right now we don't have a ton, we just have like the drive, we have some drive stuff, we have some Navex stuff, um, we have the two shooter wheels actually putting out values, um, the backpack gear sensor is on there, uh, and that's about it right now. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that's commented that if we need to we can uncomment and get back on there pretty quickly. Um, all this stuff we used to use before we had the preferences set up, um, that was something we added this year. Where you used to have to do it all on the dashboard, and you have to initialize the values and stuff, and then go in and change them on, in the actual code. It was super awful. Uh, but all of that's gone now, so we should actually delete this because we no longer need it. Uh, so we do a much better job of that with input. I don't think it's on. It's, I don't think it's on the GitHub. That almost certainly is because it's been pushed. <laughs> uh, I, I can't imagine anyone would do that. Not from radio. Like it might have been in. If you're in the wrong project or something, but it, it's good. Oh, I, I really need radio to handle that one, so. Uh, yes and no, but it's still not here because this is still radio on the project. I know, but if you, if you want to get extensions, though, it'll yes, push yes, too. Yes, yes, yes. It pushes to Gamma, but the project is still radio. Uh, this was random code for me playing around with the cameras. The, way, the old way the cameras were set up. We have the new cameras, which are all done in a subsystem now, so none of that matters. This just tells the lights to be purple at the beginning. Um, we're going to rewrite how we do lights because we're doing them kind of stupidly right now. Um, this also turns the aiming light on but it, or off, but it's not even on right now. It's not plugged in. Um, it may be something we try to get back on at some point. Uh, and then it makes a new logger. It also does make a new logger, which we're currently not using for very much, but we should at some point. Um, 
the initialize debugger sets a couple things. So it sets the flags on or off. So those flags that we created at the beginning, you can just switch basically off to on, and we can change what we're looking at. So right now we have auton and shooter enabled. Um, if I wanted to stop looking at the shooter stuff, I could just switch this to off. And now none of the shooter print statements uh, that are done in this in the proper debugger way will be printed at all. The other thing it does is it sets the level of debugging. Um, so you can set up things to where you only want to print at different levels. So we have verbose all the way to silent, which seven means we basically just turn off all print statements. We don't want to see anything on the print log no matter what because uh, we want to test something and we think the print's giving us error or something. I don't know why that would ever happen. I don't think I would ever put it on seven. Um, one, you can set up all your subsystems to tell you like every little detail about what's happening on the gear intake, right? Like you can print as it moves, you can print what motor values it's setting, you can print everything. Um, most stuff we keep in this like two to three range for our actual debug values. Um, and there's a few stuff that get to four. I don't oh, something we really weird is going on. Yeah, I don't think we have on. anything that's five or six where it's like, this has to show up no matter what. I don't think we have anything in that level um, that I know of. I don't think I've ever written anything. Um, but largely it's stuff like info is like, um, one of the things I know is info is like when we finish the turn, it tells you what, like how close it was to getting the actual angle it thinks it was supposed to be hitting. Whereas uh, debug will be like its and, angle as it's turning right, along it, with it what it's setting the talons to. And right. All so that. it's a little bit more information and maybe not what the talons do. That might be for both. No, no, no. I thought we... I mean, it might be right might now. Be, okay. Know, but in theory, it probably should be removed. Um, yeah, so that allows us to kind of quickly tell us, get us different things if we're trying to fix a problem in code. Um, and you have to remember which one of these you set up, though, and what levels you set it to. Um, or kind of get close, or go back and look, so it normally ends up happening. Uh, okay, so then these are all the things that we basically overload um, in other methods and in other classes. Um, so these are the ones that get called. So at the beginning, like once robot init gets called, We'll go into disabled, we're not enabled yet, and it would call disabled init. And all we do is we set the state here, and then we basically say disabled init has started. Um, we call it from the disabled class, which is a whole other class that we'll look at in a second. Um, and then once it's over, we print the end. So this is kind of just some formulaic stuff that we know it exists. Um, and we'll see the print statements or print the general info. Uh, if general is off, we won't see those. Um, and then I tried to do remove press, but that kind of failed. Uh, that ever worked. Yeah, we need to figure out how to fix that. Um, ideally, if this works, we'd be able to pull the ones that we didn't want out, but they weren't, preferences wasn't doing what we wanted to, so we've got to figure out what that's about. Um, um, yeah, so that's basically all of robot. Um, we need to figure out, figure out how to make this work. Uh, it's not doing quite what we want it to. Um, having these little like helper print statements down here, like I haven't met a couple of the subsystems I have, um, they make it so just debugging is quicker. So instead of having to do debugger.println, parentheses, the message you want, comma general, comma debugger.info3, you can just have print general info, do what you want, and it does it at the right level. It sets your flag, and it sets your debug level for you. Um. <sighs> okay. uh. All right, so that's all kind of boring stuff that basically gets the robot started. Uh. Where do you want to go next? Do we go into... Debugger worked probably. Maybe. You already have it open. Oh, uh, we can briefly show debugger. Um, debugger is literally just a wrapper for print statements. Like, it's not super complicated, but it makes it much easier to do stuff. Um, you basically just tell it print line, the message, which flag it is, the flags that we set up in robot, and then what level it is. Um, and then it just checks if the flag and level are set, what we do in initialize debugger, uh, and then we do it. Ideally, one of the things I want to do that I haven't yet um, is we need to write, um, write code to allow us to change flags and level on the preferences um, page. Right now, if we want to change it, we have to re-download code. 
um, which is kind of annoying and silly when we have preferences. So we'll probably write some stuff that just lets us set each flag, true or false, in preferences somewhere, and then we can just change the level with a number, and then we can change what's printing, which would be nice. Um, yeah, all those are just weird checks and stuff that it has, but we don't need to deal with that. This was somebody's code? I don't remember whose. Um, oh, 1114. Right. That's what we have at the top. Right? Thank you, Simbot. Yeah, so Simbot wrote that. We stole it. It's useful. Um, uh, go to dashboard, like smart dashboard. Um, so yeah, so all we have to do for dashboard, anytime you need to put something to the dashboard, largely if it's something we want to modify, you put it to preferences, which is just preferences.get number or preferences.get boolean. Uh, dashboard is similar. Um, if it's something you just want to get values from, like we just want to see, we just use smart dashboard.put number. Um, smart dashboard is written all for us. This is all stuff from WPI Live. We don't have to do anything with it. Uh, it, yeah, so all of them are public static methods, so you don't have to do anything special with it. You can just put the Boolean, you can just put. Uh, So these ones, these ones are set up so like, I think this is still the one we tolerate at one point. I don't know if we still use this. Um, but we could, we had this set up to where we could change this to false and disable autonomous if we wanted to, like if for some reason autonomous wasn't working. Um, but we put the boolean, so we basically told it to be a block there um, briefly and then we could go in and edit if we need to. So these ones only get run once um, at the beginning, so they're not constantly updated. Update put short is, these update regularly. We have them getting called in uh, teleop and disabled. So during, in, during their periodics, they're constantly calling these um, and putting stuff out to the dashboard for us so we can see the navx yaw and rate and drive train and stuff going on. Um, and their shooter dashboard, which is just a block of is stuff. It's currently disabled, yeah. but we could enable it and get all of the wheel speeds and everything else we wanted to. Same with your dashboard. And update put long is basically, um, it updates, but it updates less frequently. So if there's stuff that we care about, but don't care about nearly as often, um, I think the long delay is set to half a every second. half second, and the short delay is every 40th of a second. Yeah, so it's fast. Um, so there's certain things that we don't need to update faster than every half second, right? Like, which auto command it is set to if we're checking every 40 of a second, we have a problem. It's not updating that fast. Every half second is fine. Um, same with the compressor state. Like, we don't need to know how quickly it is. Um, ideally, we should move some more stuff to long just so it lowers the demands on the CPU. We don't have a lot of stuff being pushed out right now anyway, so it's not a big deal. But we had a lot more before. Um, and especially during competition, you don't want to run that much stuff going out to the dashboard. Um, but yeah, anything you want to put, you just do smart dashboard by put number. If you want to read it back, you just do smart get number. Um, if it's a true false value, you can just do boolean. Um, but it's pretty easy. There's no big issues anymore. And if it's a true false, you should use boolean yeah, so that you don't accidentally put something other than true or false. Uh, well, if you type true and false into something that's not boolean, it's not going to work either. Um, you can do it there. You can do number and use one or zero or something, but that'd be weird. Um, you can also put string. I think the only one we use that for is the autonomous name um, and the way we have put auto set up. Uh, um, so do we want to start with auto, just autonomous.java, or is that uh, way... No, I'll just say uh, auto is probably farther along. Um, Hell yeah. Probably need to start with commands, yeah. systems even before so just, we do that. Okay, so... A uh, drivetrain should be way cleaner now. Yeah, well, this is, still the, this is still oh, the okay. cars. This is the default. Um, all right, so we're not going to look at drive to drive scores. We're going to look at some of the other ones. So we have some shooter. We have some shooter. default ones that we built that are used that we never use. Um, no, so we I, do. So I, I always just write a new one. Um, I'm like, don't even bother. Like, I reference solenoid subsystem right. for like how everything works. Oh, do you not just extend it? No. So what you should do. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Shooter wheel should be pretty cool. And it has more stuff going on it than, or climber even. Yeah. No climbers for you bare bones. Oh, guarantee? No, I thought I did it differently, but maybe I didn't. What do you mean, did it differently? By using the actual extended default oh. ones, but it doesn't really matter. But basically, there's a couple default ones that currently we're not using or extending, but we probably should. Um, but they let you do stuff quickly. So if you wanted to like have a single a subsystem that ran a single solenoid for some reason, um, this kind of gives you an idea of what you need to be able to have in it to do all those things. Um, so if we wanted a subsystem to move any actuator on the robot, you would need um, some values to be able to keep track of what's going on with it. Um, so what's its extend solenoid? Is it separate? Like, is it a double solenoid? So it doesn't have an extend port and a retract port. Um, is it currently extended? We have a Boolean, so we can just check that. Um, like, have we set it to extend or not? Um, is it a double solenoid, so it doesn't have two ports? Or is it a single, so it only has one port? Um, and then the name of the subsystem, with, like so, you could have a command that is like the. So, so you call it three times during a match. It's only it's going to run the constructor the first time. It's going to run initialize at the start of each of those three times, and throughout the duration of each of those, it's going to be calling execute every time it gets around to it in the stack. Right, and the and the constructor thing is a little bit odd because like for autonomous, we may be calling the constructor multiple times. We may make a new like for like in place turn. Every time we do an in-place turn in autonomous, we are calling a new one and creating a whole new command every time. So like it would get run, but ideally you don't know that, especially on like the button presses. Basically, the button presses only get made once, and then you call them repeatedly. So uh, for if I was to do lights, should I put should I just have one command that runs and just execute, and then every single time I just have checks within the execute? Correct. Basically, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you basically you have something that it's checking on some variable, you know, or, methods, you, or some number of variables. Right. You have methods below it. Or even like a single variable that says like what value should I be displaying? Okay. You have okay. methods that change that one value. Yeah. And then the execute. In work. execute, it's always right. always change. Right. Okay. So initialize would just be like the very initial. Right. You know, maybe nothing. Right. It yeah. may you may need to have nothing run only the first time. Um, in this case, for vibrate, we have nothing in execute. Like it doesn't need to be constantly vibrate. updating things. It mm -hmm. needs to set it once, and then once it's finished. Um, which we will be able to talk about in a second. So there's a is finished command. This is running behind the scenes in execute every time. We don't need to know this, but basically part of execute for the command is it's checking, it's basically evaluating this is finished method and says, okay, if this is true, I'm done now. Um, so in this case, we're basically saying, am I have I finished my time? Um, there's other ways to set timeout. We I don't remember why I had to write my own here. We could have just set timeout. There's, uh, there was a reason. Um, I don't remember what it is, and I haven't commented, it, so it's not good. Uh, <laughs> but there was some reason why I wrote my own timeout function um, instead of using the built-in stuff that exists for commands. Um, but I can't think of why I had to do that at the moment. Oh, I think it was just when Vibrate was being super awkward and not working. I was trying to figure out if that was the problem. Um, I could probably go back and use the regular one now. And we can show you where you do that. When it comes uh, up again. Yeah, there's another, there's a couple other methods we have that time out. Um, right, so basically once this is true, it's like, okay, now I'm done. You then have your end method and your interrupted method. Um, both of these are very important. Um, end is called once after is finished is true. Interrupted is called if something else requires the subsystem that it requires. Um, in this case, no, there's no subsystem, so it could never be interrupted very easily. Um, you could call, you could directly call cancel on it. Um, I believe calls interrupted. Pretty sure. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't tell us that, but I'm pretty sure it does. Oh well, yeah, that's that's reasonable. Why we still have command base? It's not useful anymore. Um, it used to be we got rid of all the things and moved it to robot. But command base for when they originally released it, they wanted all the 
subsystems, like set up subsystems with being command based for some reason. It was super awkward and I didn't like it, so we moved it all to robot. <laughs> um, and then we still have a thing called command base that does nothing. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah, so interrupted is called when the command ends because somebody either called cancel directly on it. So like if you have a command created, you can do that command dot cancel. You can command it, or can cancel it, or if one of its requirements is also um, is called by something else. Um, we'll get to requirements in just a second. But basically, largely what you want to do for almost every command, there's a few instances where this isn't true, but most of the time, interrupted to just call end. Don't forget to do that. <laughs> it's very bad. Right, because for if you forgot to do this, and for some reason we called cancel on the vibrate command, the controllers would vibrate forever because nothing told them to stop. And sometimes in <laughs> there might be some other things you needed to take care of, but most of the time it's just yeah, end. largely. And e even if there is something else you need to call, almost always end is the last thing interrupted should call, or the first thing interrupted should call, something like that. Um, if interrupted isn't calling end, it's not good, um, largely. There's probably a reason why they could not do the same thing, but... Well, it's probably in case you needed to handle some other things if it's interrupted. Uh, there, and there's sometimes sure. where I have to like copy and paste and make them kind of duplicate because I have a print statement at end that I don't want to run if it's an interrupted. But that's pretty or rare. It's like, it's like if you need it to fail like elegantly. Right. So like if N says, hey, we're done vibrating controllers, everything went nicely, I wouldn't want to call N from interrupted. Instead, I would be like, interrupted, hey, it didn't finish on time. I don't know what happened. Um, uh, yeah, so that's a pretty simple command. There's not much to it. Um, um, Is that climber? Oh, no, no, no. Where'd the um, don't we have? Where'd the other climb go? Isn't there a new climb? Manual climb? Is it in manual climb? Oh, it's set climber. It's, definitely, it's definitely a set climber. No, because all the other stuff gets handled by the... Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Wait, no, 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 it's not. Sorry. Yeah, it is. No, it's, oh, yeah, set climber yeah, is yeah, double yeah. speed. Yeah, it is. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, set climber is how we handle... <sighs> confused if we start looking at things that we don't actually use. What in the world are we doing in the climber right now? Okay. Oh, because I made access buttons. So manual climber is gone. Yeah. Okay. And it is just set climb. Alright, so manual climb was how we used to do things before we wrote some new code. And, the, and the way easier. manual climb used to work is both drivers, both the operator and the driver could climb, but then we realized that that was just silly yes. and we gave it to just the operator. Correct. I, like, it was basically like the redundancy of, oh god, like the operator controller came unplugged and we still need to climb in a match, but when would that happen? <laughs> um, <laughs> or, 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 I, think, I think I just gave it to both of them because I figured why not just give it to both of them. Yeah, no, I mean, well, I'm pretty sure I'd said to do it on both. We weren't sure who was going to climb. I think that was part of it. Okay. Because um, yeah, with, with a lot of it, like, you don't really figure out how a lot of it gets split up until you're actually on the field and you have to figure out what's too much for one person to handle and that's what, what it makes sense for them to be doing. Invincible. Okay, right. So. Okay, so set climber basically, the way it works now is you give it a speed, it starts the climbing, and it starts the climber at that speed, like it's normally something low, and then in execute, as soon as the current is greater than 40, that's combined current across all four motors. Which isn't a whole lot, that's 10, yeah. that's average of it's 10 not across a each lot. of them. It's pretty fast, but basically it means I'm spinning slowly, and then as soon as I need to actually start picking up the robot, I go to one and I jump up the robot. Oh. Um, so that's how it does its auto climb. It's really basic. It is not complicated at all. It just, it literally just is like, hey, is there, is my, are my motors actually drawing current? Yes, now I need to climb. Because uh, it doesn't make a whole lot to just spin the thing without uh, any load attached to it. Right. It's very, yeah, we, we checked that number at some point uh, and it was small enough. And then end sets the climber directly to zero 
So as soon as you're not setting climber, right? As soon as as soon as the operator lets go, um, it goes to zero, and it turns the compressor. Right it turns on. the compressor back on, which is very important. And, uh, very important. So that we don't, we don't want to be running four seven seven five pros at full blast and a compressor yeah. I mean, because our battery just, would not be. Happy. It makes it so yeah we climb a little bit faster having the compressor off uh, during the climb. So that's more. If we were if we were really really trying to do it well, we'd turn off the headlights too. But that's a little. Um, yeah, I don't think that matters. <laughs> that, that, like, half an amp. I don't know, I don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, um, sure boost. Turn off all the lights. Turn off them. Oh. Um, just like in, com just like in subsystems, there's a couple, um, default commands, too, that you can use. So if you wanted to make, like, in theory, I could make a new subsystem and everything without writing any, I could not create a new subsystem or a new command, and I could add something to our robot. So I could just do new subsystem, new, new solenoid, solenoid subsystem, yeah, right. blah, blah, blah. And I could pass it all in line if I wanted to. Um, so it makes testing stuff a little bit easier. But most of the time, um, there's some extra behavior we want to be able to program it. Like on the actual um, robot one. But when prototyping, you, right. get, you can make something pretty quickly, which is nice. Um, it also gives you a place to look and see, oh, this is a solenoid command. What do I actually want it to do? Um, and you have some idea of what they should look like. So if we had a stick that poked out of the robot for some reason, you could look and see how to make it poke out of the robot for some reason. Um, uh, yeah, basically the boolean is extend command just checks whether you want it to extend or not. If you want it to extend or not, it extends or retracts based on that. Um, and that's pretty much it. And then once it ends, it flips it back the other way. Um, two, 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 two. Uh, auto is one of the ones that's on the back. I uh, like score. No. Nope, that's nothing, so I got rid of that. Um, what do I want? Where is... Oh, we have them in different. I forgot there's other folders. Gear folder. Okay, so all the gear stuff is in here. Um, so score gear backpack is a pretty easy command too. Um, it's constructed as nothing. Once it's initialized, it has a timeout though. So this this shows you where how a timeout works. So this dot set timeout is three seconds right now. Which probably could slow that down a little bit at some point. Hmm. Um, could probably get that lower. Um, it tells it to extend the gear cylinder backpack, so it tells it to flip open the boxes, right, and actually score the gear. Um, it has a print statement that says gear backpack scored. It's in commands, it's in debug, so if those flags are on, we'll see that, we'll see that printed out. Um, it's is finished, all it has to do is return is timed out. So instead of having to do anything that's like checking a timer or anything, if you just do this dot ti set timeout, um, Hello? And then you return is timed out in is finished. That's all you have to do to check if a command is done on time. Um, that's in seconds, so it's pretty easy to be. I want this command to run for three seconds. You can do that pretty easily with that. Uh, when it ends, it does gear backpack dot retract. It tells us we retracted um, if we have that all set. Um, at some point, I had this set it back to purple, and then I had it not do it, and it was weird, and I don't remember why, but it was, the lights weren't working the way it is. If we're making a new controller for it, right. they weren't working right. Because uh, we're trying to create a new, uh, we're just overriding some command, we're just having a bunch of random commands running at the same time, basically, for the lights. Yeah, we're going to have a single command now yeah. that will... So updating it will, this should work. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, okay, so then... Yeah, so that's all score gear backpack is. So it's a really simple command. And so a command like that, we would map to somewhere on the OI. So here's OI. Um, it has a lot of comments at the beginning that I'm pretty sure are not really valid anymore because we changed how we do a bunch of stuff. Um, they're kind of valid. So it tells you the difference between like when pressed, while held, when released, and toggle when pressed. So. When pressed, just runs the command when it's actually pressed in. While held, will continually run the command while it's held. Um, and then when released, runs the command when you actually release the button, which I, as far as I know, I don't think we've ever actually used. 
Uh, <laughs> we tried to one time. We, yeah, it didn't work, right? We, we were doing something. Well, we were trying to coordinate with like the mechanism roller, and we just really didn't work. Yeah, yeah, it never, it never worked. Um, toggle when press does like it says, right? You press it once, it turns on. You press it again, it turns off. Um, so let's see, what are we doing? So there's a couple places where we make the command up here for some reason, not entirely sure why, because you can also just do them in line. Um, so all these things over on the right are various commands that we run. So like zero gear arm current is a command that brings the gear arm up, waits for a certain amount of current, and then homes it based on that position. Uh, same with like gear 80 pre-score, intake gear, all those things are commands that we have written out over here. To actually do the mapping, we've set it up a lot nicer than what the current default way to set it up is by WPI. Which is, which, but it's still like a little bit. I just don't know what they were. It looks, basically before this year, your OI looked very similar to this. The way OI got sort of redone this year is very stupid. Yeah, we don't like it. I don't even want to go into it. We fixed, I don't even we remember how it, it works. Neither do I. We fixed it. It's now back to where it used to be, and everything is a single line for a single button as nice as um, So now you can just do, so like four, these are all operator control. So like the intake of gear command, right? We have that where if we hit A on the operator command, it drops the gear arm down, it sucks it in, it waits for current as soon as it comes up. As soon as there's enough current on the roller, it knows there's a gear there, it pops it back up to its position. Uh, so we know all that works, and basically to make that happen, all you do is new spectrum button, hardware.operator gamepad, so we know which gamepad we're on, Xbox button dot A, so we know what button to do. Wait, are there no buttons for the driver? I'm so confused. Oh, they're down there. <laughs> they're separated. <laughs> operator's a ton more, because they have all the... It was, I saw the two blocks, and I was really, because they're, they're separated by the, the new line, and I was really confused oh, yeah, what that yeah. white space was there for. I, I think I was just doing that when I was putting it all, like we were doing all the shooter stuff. Um, okay, yeah, so that's basically what you do. Um, in this case, we have one where, like, B button turns on both the shooter and tower, um, which Why should actually not that? happen anymore, but, no. I mean, now it should just be shooter, and tower should go on with the belt, but that's just not how we do it. What's on the trigger now, right? What's up? It's on the trigger now. It's all on the trigger. Yeah, yeah, but we still have B. B's been there. Oh. You can still turn that one. Um... But yes, we moved everything to the trigger, so it was one button, so you didn't have to like, press a million buttons to fire balls. Uh, okay, yeah, so then we also have a new thing called Spectrum Access Button, which lets us make any joystick access into a button, so it can run a command based on certain threshold values you set on a joystick axis, which is most useful for the trigger. Um, so like the way the shooter works now is as soon as it's over um, 0.07, it turns the shooter on. So if you have just a little bit pressed, the shooter goes on. As soon and it as turns on the intake. Yes, it also turns on the intake, which should be higher. So it turns the shooter and intake on, so we start spinning in balls in case there's balls below us that we need to spin in, and just kind of like agitating things. It turns the shooter on, or the actual wheel on. As soon as it's above mm. 0.5, it turns the tower on. Um, and as soon as it's above 0.95, which is basically all the way in, it turns the belt on. Uh, Yes, that is how that works. Mm, yeah. Oh no, well it runs fireballs, which fireballs is slightly more complicated than just turning the belt on. Because it does currently wait for shooter speed and vibrate the controller. And then load shooter. But wait for shooter speed. It? It's finished timed at or on target. So that's where we use on target. Oh, yeah, so we do use on target. And then we set the timer. 
Is that timeout row up press speed timeout? Oh, yeah. There we go. Yeah, so basically speed timeout is how long we want to make sure to wait before we start firing balls if you just pull the trigger uh, without letting it actually get up to speed. Uh, Why is there a fireball? <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a fireball. And like, yeah, fireballs. Balls. You just fire a ball. I thought you were like a fireball, yeah. like a ball on fire. That's how it works. <laughs> like, whoa, it's man. It's very easy. It's really safe in the field. <laughs> it's, a, it's, our, it's our finishing move, clearly. <laughs> um, the access button has a little bit more complicated, too. If you pass another command, or if you pass another value to it, it gives it a hard cap of things to not do. So here, um, you have your climb speed set to two, so if it's at 0.07 to 0.94, it starts at 0.2 and then it like does the current command. But if for some reason you needed to override, if you hold it full down, it'll just be at one, no matter what. Uh, which I mean, probably also climbs at this point. Like, most of the time it works. It just yeah, I kind of forgot we had both of those. Do you, do you press it all the way down or? Uh, only in like the really, like desperate situations, okay. so I just got it full. Okay. Like, okay. okay. <laughs> generally, I ramp it until. Right. Like normally, she does it to creep, and then it does it to zone, right. and then she just lets go. Uh, but yeah, in theory, you can just be like, ah. <laughs> and there was that three-second climb we tried to attempt. We did. We, we which we were, which we were over so halfway up. Yeah. We were so over close. Half <laughs> we got the rope at two. Oh. Uh, <laughs> another important detail. Not even got the rope at two. We were like at the rope at two. Okay, another important detail that you might notice is if you look at the bottom right corner of the screen, you'll see ENG right next to the time. That's very important. That little button allows me to turn on my keyboard. Oh. Uh, <laughs> this will all go away <laughs> very shortly. <laughs> what? what is this? Control shift changes between ENG US and ENG to Borak, which you can't see on the bottom right now because it's cut, cut off. But basically, there's a DV or a if you US press below it. it. See it. Oh, oh there, yeah, there we go. go. <laughs> Super annoying. <laughs> it will go away as soon as it goes. <laughs> we'll keep it. It's the only test we can Because multiple times there's been like, oh, nothing's working. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, Alan, you're, I, you never took care of Jamar, right? Because um, you just typed a random character across the screen. Did you change the uh, the keycaps on your keyboard? What? Did you, like, no, I, I touch type. Oh. Okay. So I don't um, care. Oh. Yeah, 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 okay. So the other ones we have. Um, there's some random ones that I don't think we ever use, but are there in case we need them. So like you can hit the Xbox start button to reverse the belt bed and the back button to load the shooter manually. Um, why, I don't know. I don't even know if we remember those exist. Initially, we, those are the only ways that we could Correct, that was the only way to load the shooter And we were like, what buttons do we have left? Was <laughs> to start loading the shooter, you had to hit start, which is uh, not the most convenient <laughs> thing. Um, and we have the POV button yeah, so for... So POV button is the um, D-pad. So randomly, either left or right, turns on the aiming light. <laughs> um, and up and down. Why is up while held and down toggle and press? I, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that can that's be right. Exactly right. right. There's no way that's right. Those should definitely be toggle when pressed. We don't know. It should, it should, it should be when pressed. Because you want to. Oh yeah. To Why would? Yeah, they should definitely be when pressed. Why in the world are these other things? You can go ahead and change that now and then just push. Like or that's oh that's the one over. Like so it's very weird. Really matters anyways. I feel like it's very weird. Yeah yeah. I just don't understand why that would happen. Yeah, that's just confusing. That's probably why those didn't work. Yeah, probably why that was Because those are just strange. Because while held, that would be ramping speed, like... Wait, no, but does, does it even work that way? Does it call it every loop, or does it just not... Oh, because it would never release? finish, right? So... No, it immediately no, it finishes. finishes. It so finish. it would call it every loop, because it finishes immediately. I'm pretty sure it finishes immediately. Let's find out. Okay. Does it finish immediately? It's it's finished finished trip. Trip. Yeah, so it would call it everything. Uh, which is not good. So it would ramp speed crazy fast and down you would have to hit every you'd have to hit twice every time to actually get it to <laughs> Oh no. 
<laughs> well, actually, I don't even know because it finishes itself, so I'm not actually sure. Uh, that gives you. Uh, okay, then we have the same ones for the driver has his uh, their buttons in place. So yeah, you have things like score gear, LED score backpack is weird. I don't know why. What do you mean it's weird? Oh, no, that's right. That's what we were supposed to be calling, right? Okay. Um, auto score gear backpack is on an access button, so as long as it's more than halfway down, it'll score the gear backpack based on the score sensor. Uh, we have some of the same stuff that the operator has for the gear back for the gear mechanism. Um, Yeah, basically. So that's all the OI. So all that is just commands that need to be run based on, on based on certain conditions, and they just need to happen without knowing an actual like specific value. So you uh, well, the the trait that access is specific. Value. Well, they use specific value, but they don't need they, they don't need to know the oh, the, the yeah, command yeah. doesn't need to know the access value, right? right? So like the drivetrain, where you're actually moving the drivetrain, doesn't get called an OI. Right. It, it has to be in its own command, out. and Teleop just calls that command over and over again. Or no, it, it calls it once and it execute. It just adds it to the sequence. Well, yeah, and execute just runs. Right. So it just needs to be running in Teleop all the time, right? So we tell it at the beginning of Teleop, we tell it arcade drive dot start, flap control dot start, headlights on dot start, and manual yeah. intake dot start. Flap control should really get moved to access buttons, but it's not. But it should be. It should. Yeah, it yeah. Definitely should be. Like we didn't have them when we wrote it, but it should be because we made um, access. Yeah, we made access yeah. buttons later. X button is way better. X button is infinitely better. We were way, way smarter once we figured out we could do that. Um, like, it's not the most simple thing to do, but it makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah, we should actually publish that, because that's actually super useful. I don't think anyone else has that yet. I've never seen anybody else do it yet. Uh, oh, the, the access button? The access button and POV buttons are both really, really convenient. Uh, yeah, you can press on yeah. Compared to what we were doing, like, because basically what we had to do before, we can look at what flap control does. So flap control is a command that basically had to hardwire that same stuff into there to control the flaps. So it's all on the left stick of the operator. If it's less than 0.5 um, absolute value, right? So if it's anywhere between negative 0.5 and 0.5, make sure they're both up which is extend for the gear and retract for the ball. And then Other way around. Extend for the ball retract. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. And then basically, if it's greater than zero, but not, but also not less, less than maybe yeah. 0.5, right? It does one thing. If it's the other, it does the other thing. So I, should we had to hard code that in this random command instead of having it nicely in here with OI like we could. Um, well, but then you need you need three commands, one for each of the three states. And a default command. Yes. That's how it should be. But this, this way is one command. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not how it should be. <laughs> because, you know, it's really hard telling it to, like, extend the flap randomly in, like, auto if I wanted to. What did I have to do? I don't remember what I had to do. Did I just like manually do it, or do we have extend flap already? No, I, I, I made I, I made them in auto. They're in auto. Yeah, we made flap controls, right? Yeah. So you go into commands auto. Yeah, lower ball flap. Yeah, that's dumb. <laughs> right? Like that should have already existed. <laughs> okay. okay. Right? Like that clearly for a substantive, it should have had a lower ball flap, lower gear flap, and the default of close everything, and then you just make the default that, and you have two that do it. That's how it should have been done. That's not how it currently is. We should probably fix it. It doesn't really matter. They, both functions work. One is just takes longer um, and makes it so you don't have it ready when you need to do it in auto and everything else. Um, where was I? I was in Teleop. Oh, uh, and then Arcade Drive is probably the next uh, one to look at. It. That we should not look at Arcade Drive. Wait, why not? Uh, we're not looking at Drive. Drive's gross. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one on the spectrum default. I clean up in spectrum default. On this computer. That's true. Uh, I'll go down. It should be all the way down. Subsystem. Where's the 
drive can you have that? It uh, doesn't exist. Oh, okay. That's less good. <laughs> the arcade drive? Probably add that. But well, because well, all the math is there. You just have to do the... the, 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 the sure. Okay, basically arcade drive just takes in your throttle and turn power, so you would take in your left axis, or left joystick Y, your right axis. Which, by the right way, left axis. Y axes are positive as down, negative as up, which is confusing. Yeah, so we normally, we flip it pretty quickly normally. Do we yeah. flip it in Xbox controller? Uh, we don't flip it right away. Hold on, if you scroll down a little bit further. Or no, no, we just never flip it. Right? I think we flip it. Oh, we do flip it in arcade drive. You're right. That we flip it. No, no, we don't. No, we do. No, we do. But hand back to left. No, there's no way. Because I remember having to. I remember it being a thing. Sure. Yeah. Or does it just? I think it just gets handled by all the arcade drive math. I'm pretty certain. That, like if you go a bit further down. Like I think it, it gets handled by that math right there, by all the turning math. No, how would the turn math do it? I don't sense. know. You no know way it does. Either way, it doesn't really matter. You don't really have to modify the arcade drive stuff. It exists. It basically it takes our turn stuff and allows us to turn. Um, probably should look at this a little bit more and see if we can get it a little bit more efficient. Um, the other stuff inside drive, like this still has brakes, which it probably shouldn't have on the default mm -hmm. one. But, uh, we have a method to be able to turn on and off brake mode, which is also useful. So we don't have to go sit by and do every single talent individually. Yeah, we can just do yeah. all of the drive talents at once. Uh, no, but you still have like signal in here, which is confusing. Well, because it was a baked into drive output. Yeah, but we can get rid of it. Yeah, but it, but it's like it's a it's a, it's a package a little signal, class. Like, drive signal just shouldn't exist anymore. <laughs> I'm I'm in favor of keeping it. It's so not useful. So we only pass one variable instead of having to always pass them two together. It keeps them next to each other. No, drive signal, you have to make a new drive signal every time. Yeah? It's not useful. We're making a whole class that does nothing except pass new values. That's definitely a thing. It's not useful. <laughs> the arcade I distinctly remember a conversation on Chief about, like... Or no, maybe it wasn't on Chief. It was on Reddit. Anywho. <laughs> um, no, I know it's a thing. It's just whether it's actually <laughs> makes it more complicated than what we're doing. In actual computer science, yes, you're right. In robot, I don't know if we do it. Um, okay, so what other ones do we have? So we can get into auto. Oh yeah, auto is done. Auto gets a little bit more complicated. Probably makes sense to start with autonomous. Okay. Um, I really didn't understand auto. That's right. Most of them you can literally just look at and see how they work. They're pretty simple. So like aiming light, you literally turn the aiming light on. Oh, you tell it the aiming light's on. Do you want to go over the shooter stuff? Because we haven't looked at like actual commands with PID stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. The shooter's in its own thing. Okay, so shooter has its own command, so... A shooter on and tower on are probably the T. Yeah, shooter on is probably the easiest. Okay, so shooter on, we have our PID Fs. Um, you have a speed. I'm not sure why aim light is a command in here, but okay. I don't remember why we added that, but no big deal. Apparently we have a new aiming light. Why do we have a new aiming light? That's really confusing. I have no idea why I did I swear I didn't write that. I don't remember writing that either. But apparently it happened. Um, that seems like a really odd place to put it. Anyway, initialize sets up all the PID configuration. Uh, sets it to your set point. And then... Uh, Yep, so it's, it's all on preferences, so we're getting all the PID stuff from preferences. Um, we set it to the speed that we're telling it to go to, which we get from, um, we pass in, some, oh no, it's just getting the preference speed, yeah. Um, wait, what? No, wait, where? Yeah, it's getting speed. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so it's just getting the set wheel speed from preferences. 
again, all this happens in initialize and not in the constructor, so there's, no, there's nothing in the command constructor at all. Um, so every time we run it, it's updating all of this. Um, it does mean though, that you can't have, the shooter, if the shooter wheel is spinning, if you start updating values, it's not going to change it. You do have to release the trigger and then flip it back. Um, yeah, and then we were looking at a way to fix that at some point. You know? I know, that's, like, that's like minimally... Yeah, but no, we wanted to be able to, we need to be able to fix it when we need to do teleop when we're adjusting. But I thought adjustment already... But it doesn't happen. The, I thought adjustment already just, just set it. Oh, yeah, adjustment does happen. That's right, because it's inside set. Yeah, because adjustment just yep. calls set. Yep, yep, yep. That's why we did it that way. So it works in the... So the subsystem handles adjustment. The command doesn't have to. Because in here, it starts adding speed adjustment. So as long as we have a speed adjustment there, it works on set without having to worry about this getting called again. Um, um, what do we do? So we stop the compressor when the shooter's running so that we don't have that messing with our balls, basically. Um, it doesn't let it... We don't get we get reduced that variability. Um, oh, it does. Yeah, it turns the aiming light on whenever the shooter's on. Um, I guess that's why it's there. That makes some sense. Yeah. Then the execute just basically it puts out wheel speed and things. This is on a debugger level, so that if we're up at info, this would never happen because this is happening every cycle through. <laughs> It's telling us what the wheel speed is. Um, no, no, if you're on info, you would get this. No, it's on debug. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. So yeah, if you're on info, you win it, because you only... It goes you, you go down, right? So you have to be on debug to get this. Um, <sighs> is the escape character in there? Well, no, but the, no, 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 because the space... Then you have a space to serve your new one. That's the new line character in, for the escape. So basically, he has it. So wheel speed and then wheel set point come out one after each other on beneath new each other instead of without yeah, having instead of like yeah time. without having to do a whole nother command. Oh. You can just do slash n and escape down and do the carriage return. Um, um, it never finishes by itself. We always wait till we actually release stop the button. It. Yeah, we want to make sure we release whatever the button is. Um, however we're doing it in OI. Um, and then end, it tells us we're turning the shooter wheel off. It turns the shooter wheels to break mode, so it actually stops the shooter wheels, because we don't want them just to like sit there and free spin for a long time. Um, then we disable them, we start the compressor again, and we turn off the aiming light when we're done shooting. Um, and then Tauron is basically exactly the same thing. Except instead of getting a speed, we get a ratio, and the tower just gets set to some proportion of the uh, wheel speed. Well, that's interesting. So the tower wouldn't adjust, though. It's probably mm -hmm. not matter. What? The tower wouldn't adjust live like the shooter does. It doesn't adjust live. Oh, no, it doesn't. Yeah, because it couldn't. There's no good reason for it to want to do that. Um, also, the lights only go green when the tower's on, not when the shooter's on. Yeah. Not only that matters, it's just interesting. Um, um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure if we want to keep the ratio method. I mean, it's working right now, so we're not going to change it immediately, but I feel like being able to set the speed directly, as annoying as it is, may have been better at some point. Uh, I don't know. I guess it did. When I was doing it, it made more sense because we weren't quite sure what the USB wanted to be. Right. No, I agree. That's what I'm saying. I think eventually, though, it, if we could figure it out, it probably makes more sense to eventually be separate, where you're setting exact RPMs for both. Um, yeah, so it's basically the formula for every command. They're all pretty much the same. Um, like, there are a lot of files, but they all pretty much follow one or two of the exact same patterns over and over and over again. Um,
Um, for autonomous, things are actually somewhat easier because we we know everything, right? We can ignore everything that the two gamepads are doing, so we know what's happening um, most of the time. Um, the actual autonomous um, class itself, all it does is set up what we're going to call. So. Um, still have that, I don't know why, because we don't use that anymore, but it exists. Um, that was when we were gonna, we were like using little, we had the little radio boxes to be able to choose which autonomous mode to use. Um, that that way, system like, was would super annoying. Because it would just never work the way it was supposed to, like intended, it would just not work. So, we, so the, why are there no yellow screen lines? So how do we choose autonomous? Why are there no what? Why are there no squiggly lines under auton chooser? Is it, because it, it would give it the yellow squiggly lines. Oh, I mean, it's, it, oh, it's definitely exists somewhere. I just don't know. We apparently still push it out here in a minute. No. Oh, no, because you did it on a net, not on auto I am so okay. Yeah, I can just go away. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to break something somewhere then. No red boxes. No red boxes. That's confusing. Anywho, right. whatever. Apparently, it doesn't need to be there. Um, that was old code that we didn't need. But yeah, back to this. So basically, auto name and auto number are how we match up which autonomous we're actually running. So like determining whether we're running side gear or determining whether we're gonna run hopper auto. Um, you basically, we set auto number to be a certain thing. Um, in this case, I'm just initializing stuff in case for some reason preferences all die and nothing works. Um, it runs center gear backpack as its default right now. It's probably not the best idea, but <laughs> if for some reason everything fails, it'll try to run out and it'll cross that line. Thing. Uh, yeah, it'll cross the line, it'll probably, it might throw a gear. Uh, right now it wouldn't throw a gear, because it would wait for the gear backpack to be hit. But before it would throw a gear. And then um, it's happy. Um, yeah, and I have it finished drive false, so it would just, it would time out on its drive forward. It would cross the line and do nothing else if for some reason everything failed. Uh, okay, so that's kind of, those are just the variables initialization. Um, okay. uh, <laughs> I was just gonna uh, okay, so the start of autonomous init, we reset the navx and tell it its yaw is zero, so right at the beginning before we do anything else. Um, we then run select auto, which is how, which is the thing that actually calls and get and chooses which auto to run. We'll go into it in just a second. Um, if the boolean for smart dashboard enabled is true on the smart dashboard, it'll actually run the auto command now and actually do what it's supposed to do. Not sure why compressor got stop. It's not really weird either. Same with headlights off. We should both happen slightly earlier. They don't really matter. It all happens fast enough to where it doesn't matter, but doing it beforehand is slightly better. Um, okay, so yeah, so you would get auto command that start at the beginning of initialization. So that should be finished actually. Okay. Um, so as soon as the auto command dot start happened, hmm. it would print that, and then it would be done with initialization. It would go into execute, or it would go into periodic. Periodic just does git instance dot run. Um, this is the thing that actually runs commands. So we didn't talk about this in Teleop yet either. But if for some reason this scheduler dot git instance dot run isn't running, no commands will actually work, right? You can tell the command to start, but nothing actually happens without scheduler dot git instance dot run. Um, and that would be an auton and in Teleop, right? Scheduler dot git instance dot run. And disabled. Oh, it's nice. in every periodic, yeah. Um, because there are some commands we're running in disabled too. Um, 
So like we had the command where like the we could like move the gear trigger and like have the aiming light turn on. And in and theory, your LED falling. should also be running yeah, and right, yeah, flashing. Yeah, yeah, everything can be running and disabled. Uh, dashboard at update dashboard <coughs> is just putting out the dashboard stuff still even in autonomous. Um, Select auto. Okay, but yeah, select auto. So um, this is just a giant switch statement for which autonomous command we want to run um, at the beginning. So we have a get number 1A dash auto member, so it's the very top thing on our preferences list. If we change this number, we choose which auto to go to, um, and then which it case. puts the um, auto name out as well somewhere. What well, hasn't set the auto name? Yeah, where do we define? Somewhere auto name is supposed to go out to. Oh, it goes out to dashboard. That's right. In in update dashboard, auto name happens. So as soon as you set auto name here. Update dashboard gets it from autonomous .auto name um, and puts it in a box. So then you can see which autonomous we're going to run. So if you change that number to two, you'll see side peg backpack. Um, three is fireballs, then side peg backpack, which is the wrong band. Yeah, it happens. Um, <laughs> which we never actually use. We just program. Uh, never tuned. No, yeah, we never tuned it. But ideally. In theory, we should have the 10 ball plus go into the side gear, but we never made it work. Um, six is hopper, so we have, and that's the one we actually run. So right now, we basically just run one, two, and six. Um, Five used to be the bee's knees. <laughs> or no, sorry, four. Four was the bee's four knees. Four was our original one before we had the backpack. Five, ideally, we never have to run, but <laughs> <laughs> we never. Um, five is Five is we need five points. Go. Wait, hold on. What's what five? What all that comments? Yeah, there's one of the very oh, default. I thought there was another like seven or something that was. Oh no, it's it's just one in case everything. Right, right, right. In case, in case you accidentally type in seven. Oh yeah, so this was the odd. This was the odd. Sendable chooser thing, which was all part of the. I would just don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Battery trainer in the first 30 seconds. Oh, yeah, now this whole like suppress raw type thing. Awesome. What does that do to suppress raw? Type? Um, it suppressed the deprecated warning from other stuff. Not important. But something they were, it was all part of the library being annoying. Um, or you change the library every single year? Yeah. Not like horribly, like they upgrade it, but some of their upgrades are stupid. But like when they break buttons. <laughs> like when they basically broke buttons. Like I don't know what they wanted us to do, but we so figured we, out. We were at the Dallas practice. Then. Yeah, we didn't figure out they broke buttons until Dallas. They were like, okay. And then like so we had like a team come up to us and like, hey, how do you do buttons? They were like, don't worry, we figured this out like an hour ago. Do this dot, what would this be? This dot add parallel. Yeah, right, so we have an add parallel. New hopper hitter? Or new, new uh, deploy hopper. So now it has a new deploy operator, and it'll cancel at the end of auto anyway because that command will cancel. So we don't need to have a we don't need to force an undeploy here, but we could. Um, but it should cancel at the end of auto no matter what, because all the commands cancel at the end of auto. Um, 
That's why like the shooter turns off and stuff without us telling it to. Because oh. um, <laughs> that would be bad, otherwise if all the auto commands just kept running. Uh, that would make for a much less happy robot. Um, yeah, so that's literally what we would have to do for adding a whole tiny subsystem to the robot. That should be everything, I think. Uh, there's no, like, we don't have any commands. We don't have any dashboard commands for it or anything. We didn't put any debug statements in it. Um, so those things should probably happen. Um, which you can do pretty easily. So, like, inside the... Um, the subsystem is probably the best place, actually, for it. So it would be in here. So like at deploy, you would have um, debugger dot. Who actually? The best way to do it is to build your own little class for it. Probably goes in output. methods are called, we would get a little print statement if we were on debug and output were on, we would see that those outputs happened. a lot easier than the scariest thing is if you walk up to anybody's robot code and they just have one giant file, <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> You're just sad and you just it walk takes away forever. Just walk away yeah, it takes forever to do anything. Okay, so the folders we haven't looked at at all are utilities and drivers. Um, utilities is where the actual debug class is. Um, it also has the logger. It has some other stuff that we use. It has some random stuff from the poofs that we need to get rid of. Our drivers class is where we put all of our stuff for like spectrum button, um, a bunch of spectrum stuff that we have thrown in that we wrote. Um, there's some basic stuff like spectrum digital relay. It's how we like did the flashlight. So it tells you like how to turn on and off a flashlight on an input and you can make them things. Um, it's also where we do stuff for different sensors. Our gamepad class is in here. Um, so this is how we map everything to the Xbox controller. Don't we now just oh, use no, Xbox controller? No, we don't use GamePad anymore. Never mind. What? Yeah, we just use Xbox controller. Cause yeah, because they wrote. Yeah, yeah. So GamePad used to exist because WPI Lib didn't have an Xbox controller class at all. So you still just like had joysticks, and it was thinking they were joysticks. and had to remap everything. But now Xbox controller is better. So like this should all actually go away, basically. Um, <sighs> DS buttons is the class written for the driver station buttons that Ian's or making. that Ian is currently working on. Um, Ian is currently crying over. <laughs> um, what other ones exist? So things like different like sensors and stuff if we had, if you need certain math for them. So this is like a sharp um, IR distance sensor. For some reason it has a super weird way to actually get inches back. Um, that Wait, Matthew what? Did some crazy formula for it's like a, it's an approximation. It's weird. Um, it's like it because it, it gives it back in like a. 
the logarithm or something, so like we approximated. Wait, so what's the sharp? Polynomial. Oh, it's the, the IR distance the IR. sensor. Okay, yeah. But it, like it returns like this really weird value based on distance that doesn't make any sense, um, and that approximates it back to inches. <laughs> um, let me find VGA I don't know where the AV back. Uh, yeah, it's actually it should be a couple like right on top of there actually. On top of like, Right in front of that bookshelf in there. Okay. There's a bin with some. Um, yeah, I don't remember why. We figured it out like in 2012 for one time. And we just held it over until now. <laughs> um, but yeah, anytime other sensors that we have, we would make things like that for it. We had a LiDAR light sensor at one point that we never actually got working. Um, but a lot of this is holdover code from whenever the last time we started working on this was. That's probably from 14. Yeah, I think that was when he had the lighter. Yeah. Or was it 15? Why would we have used lighter in 15? No, 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 it wasn't when we were using oh, lighter. It was, when, it was when he had it and was fiddling it. Yeah, it was either 14 or 15, either way. That's from on that one. Uh, button's so much better. Why did we not do this? <laughs> oh, we also, that's kind of broken though. What? Because we eventually need to make, I mean, for us it's fine because we just only use Xbox controllers. But if you wanted to use a joystick, they're all broken. <laughs> I, mean, I feel like I feel like you'd have to make new ones. Right, but the framework is there and it's yeah, fine. And yeah, it tells you how to do it. This is true. Because you can't use joysticks with these currently because they only work with Xbox controllers. Or they'd just be super awkward. That's the button. Because none of the axes would line up. Yeah, nothing would line up. Um. <sighs> Any other questions? Happy to go back over anything. No questions. No concerns. Um, no, I didn't understand any of this, Alan. Can you please go over it all again? <laughs> I'll run into a problem later. Um, let's see. Never, yeah, I never ran any vision stuff yet. Does the Spectrum default by default have the uh, smart dashboard? Yeah. Yeah. Intake gear. So like intake gear itself is a command group, so it's one of the few that we actually have a button pressed command group. Oh, okay. yeah, because it just sucks up. So that's how it that's how it works, right? So it starts, it brings the gear arm down to position, it turns the intake on, um, it intakes gear until current, which basically senses the current on the intake motor. If you haven't figured out by now, we really like current sensing. It's really, it's just easy. Um, <laughs> because you can do things like because all we do is we set the is finished command to be is the gear intake talon dot get output current greater than robot preferences dot gear colon in amps <laughs> limit. Uh, if it is, it finishes the command. When it finishes the command, it vibrates the controllers uh, and it sets the intake to zero. If it finishes, oh, that's another place where we have it. That's a good example of when they're different for end and interrupted. So end vibrates the controllers, interrupted does not. <laughs> so if, if we end, it, no, no controller vibrate. Or if we interrupt, no controller vibrate. If we end, controller vibrate. So it means we have a gear or we don't. Um, then. <sighs> Yeah, I forgot about that. So it, it, it goes to zero, and then as it's coming up, yeah, it, it literally just runs it, it manually forces it to run briefly while it's coming up, because we were losing the gear oh, so on just occasion. to make sure that it's stayed. Yeah, like it's a like total just like hack, but it works. But like we just threw it at it, and it was like, yeah, it's fine. 
<laughs> like it, it starts intaking, it'll stop intaking, it'll start raising, and like it wouldn't be all the way in. So like instead of like figuring out a better way to do it, I was like, I don't know. Or it tuning the current. More. Yeah, I was like, run it for a second, it's fine. <laughs> that fixed it all. Um, well, if you tune the current more, it'll stay down longer, which is what we didn't want to oh. do. Right. Like we wanted to have it do it while it was up, and like that was the easiest way. It was just like, yeah, it'll fix it. It'll be fine. The real question is, why does gear on PID up run twice? <laughs> oh, then it runs it once for a second. I think there was an actual reason for that. I don't remember why. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> um, Do you want to show them a uh, command group? Okay, so then, okay, so for, so how we do some of these. So the auto commands that exist. Let's use center backpack. Let's just start with uh, the yeah. one. Okay, so. For each command that we're running in auto, they're actually not a command, they're a command group. So command groups are just a sequence or collection of commands that you run in order or in parallel. Um, yeah, so we write out all the commands. We use the same ones in teleop that we use in auto for certain things. Um, but then it's just kind of you can it make them sequential, which is the nice part. So in here, for center gear backpack. Um, I have zero clue why it's looking at hopper angle. Oh, because I just needed it. <laughs> and in theory, it should be the same. It should be the same angle as the hopper angle. Because it's, it's that right Oh, turn. I got you. It's the, OK. Yeah, so yeah, I could yeah, be bothered yeah, to yeah. change it to anything else. Okay. like, all right, I'm just going to steal what I know okay. a right turn is. So this is for the is finished. So as we're coming back from the gear backpack, we turn ideally 90 degrees, and then drive off to be able to go to the center field, even out of the center. We never got to test it at IRI. Theory it works. Um, who knows? Um, but it was so after we hung the center gear, we could still clear to the midfield. Um, OK, right. So the way gear back, they, they normally work. Super, does super need to get called every time? I don't think it actually matters, but probably. It's fine. I mean, you, do might, it. you might as well. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't hurt. Um, yeah, so this is just basically figuring out which angle we're turning or which direction we're turning, left or right. So what angle to set it to. Um, and then for your command groups, the way they work is you do um, add parallel. The Hopefully you covered this in computer science, but if not, the only reason we have this there is so that we don't have to remember to type add parallel, you can just do this and hit enter. Because um, typing this dot is way faster than remembering what you're supposed to actually type. Um, so it's just a method from... And it says pull up all of my class. methods that I yeah, that are in this class. myself. Yeah. Um, and since this extends command group, it has all the command group methods. Um, so this dot add parallel, zero gear on current. So the very first thing we do in parallel, so nothing is waiting on this to finish, is it zero is the gear on current at the beginning of every auto. Um, we then have a add sequential, which so means- So at the same time that it's zeroing the gear arm, it starts driving forward. Right, and nothing else, and it doesn't do anything else until after this add sequential happens. Right, so until this add sequential finishes, nothing else in the command works. The number you see at the end here is its timeout. So it'll drive until spring sensor or four seconds. So it'll basically wait, drive. Wait. I thought we got rid of that. Because we don't want it to drop the gear. Or is that the side effect? In theory, we don't that want that. Effect. In theory, we don't want that timeout, though. This is the same. In case we it'll, miss. It'll drive forever. In case we miss. It'll drive forever. <laughs> <laughs> But then, but, no, but then we, but then we drop the gear. No, is no, it, we isn't don't. This center gear. This center gear. Doesn't matter for this is center, right? Mm -hmm. Must have. Oh, they still oh, wanted to spit it at the times that we didn't drive straight. As long as the rest of our seat, it's good. <laughs> we can figure out a different way to do that. That's fine. I get that we're going to drop the gear here, but we can stop dropping the gear. But not having that timeout is a very bad plan. It doesn't drive that fast. It would clear the field in 15 seconds. <laughs> okay, but then we'd have to be really messed up. <laughs> You'd have to have aligned it so poorly for that to happen. No, but if it ran it from like the side. Okay. 
<laughs> like we can fix that problem another way than getting rid of the timeout. The timeout needs to be there. Because the side gear, because it was still doing other stuff, it just didn't wait for the trigger. It still did its motions. But it still backed up with the gear. It just didn't score it. Yes. No, 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 we changed that so that it doesn't. We changed it so it just sits there. For side, we did. Oh, maybe. But it does, like, actually sit, though. It doesn't keep driving forward, though. Yes. Uh, which is what we'd have to do here. Okay, so, either way, right now, it drives forward it, or until four seconds and spits the gear by itself no matter what right now. And then which while it's It's also not necessarily a bad thing, because it could be that the spring center's just messed up. Okay. So, we, so, in this case, it would score. And then it waits a quarter of a second for the solenoid to actually start Which moving. is happening while the score backpack is happening, right? So like, it throws it, it waits a quarter of a second, and then starts well, backing so it, up. It sends the signal to throw it, Correct. then starts waiting a quarter second. Yes. Uh, and then after that quarter second, it backs up. Uh, some distance that we have set in preferences, backpack probably, gear, probably wrong. backup distance. According to this, it has, it has a 30, a 30 second, second timeout on that, which seems like a terrible plan. Um, I'm not sure why that got to be. That should be, should be three, serious. not 30. Uh, <laughs> should be five, 15. <laughs> and then, if finish drive is done, it will um, it'll do the rest of this stuff to where it actually will turn out to 90 degrees some direction, um, and then keep going around and try to finish up into the neutral zone, ideally. Um, a bunch of preference distances for those things, um, so we can set them to be different distances. Um, <coughs> command groups have Initialize, execute is finished and all that too, just like a command. Um, you don't need to use most of them normally. Like you just call the initial, this is all in the constructor, right? So this only gets called once. So like if we want to change one of these commands, we do need to um, either normally, sometimes it requires a full robo, uh, a Rio reset. It shouldn't. The only thing it should have to do is run select auto, which happens at the beginning of autonomous, right? Because we make a new, we make a brand new one of those command groups in select auto. Um, so as long as you rerun autonomous, it should make the new command group every time, um, which is fine. Um, but in addition to that, we have some initialization stuff that happens at the beginning of the command group, so before any of these things even happen also. Um, it checks if it's on right, it zeroes the yaw sensor, um, it sets the talon position to zero, and it sets the talon brake mode to true to make sure we're in brake mode when we're driving in auto. Uh, and that's pretty much how that works for all of our autonomous commands. Um, they're all roughly the same thing. How does drive so, distance work? Uh, we'll get that in just a second. Um, okay, so then, like, so hopper auto is basically the same thing. We have a sequential command that does drive distance. We do add parallel, so at the same time, oh no, so actually I moved that to after we start driving, because for some reason it was taking a second to do these, even though it shouldn't. Um, it does zero gear on corn and lower ball flap. Just before it Just begins. before we start turning. So that's why, like, if you see it in auto, we'll back up. We'll start turning and you'll see the flaps go down. Um, it does the in place turn, it drives into a wall. Um, the way we do Hopperado, I feel it. Uh, the way we do Hopperado oh this year is it's doing it on current sensing on the drivetrain. So if as we drive into the hopper, it drives until we think we're moving the field, right? Like it's like, oh, we clearly ran into something, we should stop. Um, <laughs> And then it turns the shooter on, it waits half a second, it turns slightly off to get us to the right angle to make the hopper, um, and then it starts firing balls pretty quickly. Uh, I think immediately, yeah. So it has half a second and starts firing balls. 
Um, and then it waits seven seconds, and it flaps the balls, and it raises the ball flap right at the end of auto to try to get in the last like two or three shots. Um, we played around with that a lot, and we got a lot of random ball flapping that uh, failed horribly. Uh, <laughs> that can all be deleted now. I think it's the end. Uh, no. Ooh. That is how Hopper Auto works. Very similar to all of the autos. They're basically all the same. Okay, so drive straight. Yeah, okay, so drive straight or drive distance is a little bit trickier, but not a ton. A lot of this is debug stuff. Um, basically, this is just telling. It's giving more values to the talons and telling it, hey, here's, her, here's where I want to go. Get me there. Um, uh, I think this is one of the first times we've seen requires. So this requires robot.drive. So it's saying, hey, no other commands can be trying to give the drivetrain stuff. I own it right now. Don't move it. Like, that would be bad. Oh, uh, uh, what is it? So the wheel diameter up there says 4.2. And, but when it says when you get the prep talk get number of wheel diameter, it's 4.0625. Yeah, yeah, so the one at the top is just in case for some reason we'd stopped initializing it uh, anywhere else, right? So that was the first time I ever touched it. Okay. You okay. just give it some value so that in case it's completely broken, yeah. it, you don't get a null pointer. Yeah. Um, we come down again and we do it that get number wheel diameter here, right? And then. That comma, even this one, is still just its default value okay. in case there's nothing in the preference table. What this actually returns is whatever's in the preference table. Yeah. I believe it's actually this still, mm -hmm. but right. so we did set it to the default in case we lose the preference table at some point. Uh, well, because we were doing it on the practice robot. Yeah. Oh, were we? No, we were doing it on the real one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, this is before IR. Yes. Okay, so drive distance just basically gets both of the left and right talons. Um, it figures out how long the timeout is for it, um, and it requires robot drive. And then it initialized. It what does it do? It changes the control mode of the right talon to percent V bus. Um, The drive trait, oh, we added the drive trait term adjust. Yeah, so that's just a small, that's basically the small amount of um, voltage to take out or add to the right side to try to get it to drive straight. That's not the best way to do it. There's a much better system that we should be using that we'll try to implement next year that basically uses the gyro, gyro and encoders on both sides to actually get us to where we're supposed to be. Um, we should be able to implement it next year. I don't know if we more about how to do it if we start doing this robot. Um, the left talon is the one that's actually doing all of our distance stuff. So in here, we start by setting its position to zero. So we say, hey, I'm at nothing right now at initialize. Uh, if the target is greater than zero, we make sure that our peak output voltage is the correct stuff for going negative. Yeah, because forward is backwards for our units, what we're doing. Um, so the nominal, I think we set all this at the beginning too, but we just double check that it's all in there. Um, in here we set F, P, I, and D. F is feed for, forward. Um, P, I, and D are what we do with P, I, and D. We'll, that's a whole other thing that we don't need to get into right now, but we'll have, we can talk about P, I, and D later. Um, the way motion magic works is you have to give it a cruise velocity and a cruise acceleration. All of this, the best way to learn how to do it is to go in here and find the motion magic thing and read it like a million times before you actually figure it out. Uh, uh, but yeah, there's a whole Java walkthrough from like page 99 through quite a while. Um, and it, it is, it's easier than the thing it's imitating, but way harder than most other stuff that we've done 
Uh, namely, because like things like the units get weird because there's there's encoder ticks, which is like the actual units the encoder gets back. There's Talon SRX ticks, and then there's also RPM. And figure out what you're actually setting anything in is very confusing. Um, I'm pretty sure that 250 is not RPM. Uh, <laughs> it's like some weird tick number, I believe. So I have to do like the math to get it back to RPM. Yeah, it's native units per 100 milliseconds. <laughs> Which, again, it's not really, it's not complicated, right? Like, it's just basic unit conversion. It's just annoying. <laughs> so you have to go from, like, if you want it to be 600, 600 rotations per minute, you then have to do it to seconds, and then seconds to uh, 100 milliseconds, times native units per rotation, and you figure all that out. You eventually get to some number. <laughs> um, yeah, so you set all those things, you tell it to enable itself, you change it to motion magic, and then you set the target, you basically just set it set point. Um, and I apparently tell it to print the distance target just directly without using debugger for some reason. I'm not sure why I did that. But that. B-Dugger. B-Dugger? B-Dugger. 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 Um, we set up the timeout, so in case we don't ever reach the setup, the set point, we have the timeout there. Uh, we actually have the debug call, the proper one, uh, with like set point, current position, et cetera, happening. Uh, we get the yaw rate for some reason, but I don't think we actually use it anywhere anymore. We were at some point. Um, and then in execute, all execute does is make right drive equal roughly what left drive is equal minus some turn adjust stuff. Um, because all the actual, everything that's actually happening is it's just left. happening on the Talon SRX right. with the set point. Like it's doing all the math, it's figuring out everything is. All we have to do is tell it it's current. Right. Uh, we just tell it it's set point, it does everything else. The tricky bit is doing all the tuning, which is what this long, like, seven pages of this guy tells you how to do. Um, 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 is finished. It checks if it's on. If it checks how low its error is, or if it's timed out. Um, we again write our own get error method because the one from the Talon is super weird and it gives it to you in like whatever native <coughs> units are and I never know what native units are. Um, then we also have a get inch error which tells you the error in inches because it does math times the, or it, it multiplies the error by the circumference of the wheel. Because um, the error here rotation. is in rotations, yeah. Uh, and basically just gives us our debug statement telling us how far off we were um, and did it time out or not. Um, we then the set the drive train to zero. We then change the control mode back to percent VBus so that we're not still trying to drive them in motion magic when like the hands move in the joystick or the driver's moving the joystick, that'd be bad. Uh, we have some more like debug statements we have that are set up for us, which is nice. So you can do debug just like straight string, and it automatically sets it to a debug level. It tells you not, you're not on, et cetera. Like you have to write all those all the time. Um, so that's what that one does. Um, but then another one I didn't like. That one's really different, and weirdly in a different spot. But that's whatever. Um, and interrupted again calls the end like it's supposed to. Uh, yeah, and that's basically how we get to where we're going. And the odd doesn't actually trouble. Um, we had a robot.constant? Yeah, we used to. How long ago was that? 
No, we still do. Apparently. Wait, where? It's not in. I have no idea what this even is. Where is this? Oh, it's still here. Do we call it anywhere else? No, I think this is clearly from Cheesy Poof Code. It's definitely Cheesy Poof Code. Because it has peacocks in it. Peacocks? Yeah. What was the peacock? 2015 can grabber? Oh. <laughs> I don't know why this is still in our code. I have no idea. It's super really cool. I think I got rid of it when I did Spectrum Default. I know. I <laughs> oh, I think it's still used somewhere in Drive, which is why we don't delete it. Is it? Yeah. There's some part of the Drive code that still cool. exists that we'd have to delete other parts of. But <laughs> like um, which, again, why Drive is really gross and we're not. Uh, More or less explains autos. They're basically all the same after that. Um, in place turn is a little bit different. A little bit different because it just has to look at the navex. Uh, um, so in place turn because we have to do the PID here, which we don't actually really do. We kind of do it. Um, let's see. Bolt towns are in percent V bus mode. We give it a max voltage while we're turning. It's like negative six right now. I think we. Oh, this is this. probably an opportunity to explain how PID actually works. What it what it's actually doing. Like the math. Yeah, I don't actually think we PID. No, it's in it's in PID command. Oh yeah, we do do it here, don't we? Yeah, we do. Oh yeah, we set the. checks that are more useful but PID trickier to know how to oh, yeah. the very basic equation of PID, like what we're, what we're actually looking at. Uh, equals, so you start with KP, which is your proportional, uh, times E, which will be our error, yeah. plus KI, which gets used far less often, uh, times the integral of error, so basically just the error summed up over the course of your PID command, over the course of your control loop, usually minus KD times the differential of error, which if you're doing a, a position control loop, this derivative is just your velocity. And if you're doing velocity, this derivative is your acceleration. So all of so K P K I K D these are all just constants that you set and the, the other three terms right so this is this is a constant this is a constant this is a constant and this is a variable so this is a variable and this is a variable so you set these three constants and they do all so the way this output actually gets used though it depends a little bit on your individual system so the way we use it is this is negative this is negative one to one. So you, you scale all these all these constants so that the output that you get at the end is between negative one and one. And then when you actually want to use it, you we multiply that by our I think I think we call it the nominal voltage. 
So the, yeah. the maximum voltage we want to allow it to give to the motors, and that will scale it from, you know, if we want our maximum voltage to be eight, we scale it from negative eight to eight. Um, but depending on your system, this can be minus 1023 to positive 1023. This can be any number of things. Uh, yeah, and basically you never use I. Yeah. Like largely is, just never use I. This is a <laughs> like, We call them PID controllers, but they're PD they're, controllers. And, and then there's F and like, does F go in this equation? Yeah, so it's literally it's just, just largely F. it's just plus F. Yeah. Like, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it's basically just plus F. We don't, like, in real life they use I, right? Um, so it depends on what you're doing, right? right? So you use I if you want to do things like make a thermostat, right? Like I is super important if you're trying to get a room to be at a certain temperature, because if you're like at 95 degrees, but you want to be at 96 degrees, you use I because that little bit of error accumulates over time and then allows you to move up to the point you actually want to be. In things that are updating really fast, you don't need I. Just because it happens so quickly that it, it, and there's always a little bit of error that you'd end up it's way harder to keep an adjustment. To keep I under control. Yeah, yeah, like you end up having to max I anyway. And like there's a way to do velocity control where you're just using um, I and D, but that's, or I and P, but that's really just because of the way calculus works, not because you're actually using I. Because uh, you're setting the rate of change of a system and not the output of the system. Uh, or your input is already. Uh, literally, it's um, okay. Uh, yeah. So for large portions of the robot, it's unbelievably simple, right? Like it's things like lower ball flap that all they do is say gear flap extend, ball flap retract. Right, like that, that is literally what it is. Right? You can write the ball flap code if you want to do. The hardest thing is probably not the hardest, from what I've seen. The hardest to like, the drive distance. Yeah, so the, the hardest thing of any of it is actually testing it on the robot and making sure it actually works, making sure you don't have failure cases, thinking ahead of time and knowing what is going to be useful. Um, because like even just writing, like adding the ball flaps to the robot shouldn't have been like, yeah, they're simple, like this bit of code is simple, but that's one of five or six files you need to write if we're adding ball flaps to the and robot. And there's also you have to sit there and figure out, okay, if I want in this condition, I need like this piston to be, because the pistons are opposed to each other. So one of them is extended, one of them is retracted. Right. So it took me a couple of tries to like actually finally figure out. And in theory, when we, when we know them. that, we should go into gear backpack and make methods that say right. ball flap <laughs> down, <laughs> gear <laughs> flap down, <laughs> right? Instead of, flap, instead of gear flap extended, extended track, right? Because those, those aren't useful for anybody else. So yeah. it's thinking those through, putting those in the actual subsystem so it's easier for everybody else to do. Making your code readable for other right. people. Right. Uh, so that when you leave, you know, it's like, see ya, bye bye, good luck. Uh, because yeah, because basically, if we're if we're adding a new subsystem, like what, what's something we could add to the robot? Uh, if we were adding, uh, one of the, one of the things we were talking about adding was um, if we can figure out a way to add hopper hitter things so that we can be closer to, uh, so we can catch more of the balls. Because in theory. When we drive into the hopper, we could have something sticking four inches past our bumper to the left or right. Um, we just have to retract it before we put the gear and take down. Uh, so if we were to add those, put the ball flap down. Right? No, the ball flap doesn't pass the bumpers. Doesn't? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't pass the bumpers. It passes the frame. Yeah. Okay. okay. But we could go past the bumpers. The bumpers. Yes. Uh, and then we could catch all the balls, and actually we could shoot more on it and be better. Uh, so if we were going to add that you would have to, normally would start by adding the subsystem. Uh, so we would come in here. Um, I would probably just copy solenoid subsystem if I was going to make it separate. You could do it without doing that at all, and you could just do it. You could probably Extending do it all on subsystem. its own subsystem. Yeah, so I'd probably just extend solenoid subsystem. But I could do it even easier and just do it in line if I wanted to, but it's kind of gross. Um, like you just make new solenoid subsystem every time and like just use it. Uh, uh, but in here, if I wanted to do it, I can make um, hot 
Hopper or Hitter or something Hopper. like that. Hopper. Yeah. Um, it could be really fancy. Or Spectrum 3847. Hmm? You probably have to do the whole thing, right? Mm. The whole path for it? Oh, yeah, probably. That's kind of odd. Oh, that's what we have to do. Okay. Uh, I was like, I know I just type it in the So you just hit browse and then it comes up and does it. So now that's my super class already. Uh, and then you can do inherited abstract methods, constructors. So now I have a hopper hitter subsystem. It has all the things that the default solenoid one did. I don't need all of these. It's probably on a single solenoid actually, so you you can get rid of the int ones. Right. So I could I can, I can basically just say I know I'm going to pass the spectrum solenoid to it. I'm just going to force myself to do that. Um, what else would we need in the subsystem? So this is a little pneumatic cylinder that like sits on the side of the robot somehow. It extends to be able to be just to the side of our robot so we can hit the little hopper trigger with it. That's all it does. So what are the methods we need? So let's go back to Oh, let me open it up. Oh yeah, so we can open up we can open up solenoid subsystem, right? Because that's the thing it's extending. Yeah. So in theory we have an extend retract and is extend. That's basically all that's been given to us. Um, do we want to call it, do we want to have other methods that say like, um, I don't know what they would be, but they could be, I don't um, know what, you mean. Um, what would we have it, we could have it be something that tells us that it's out or deployed, right, so we have like deploy, uh, and that could just call extend, that would be reasonable. It doesn't really matter, it would just be renaming it. Except I can't spell. Um, we could have retract already exists, but why not? You could override it and call itself. Um, that'd be weird. But retract already exists. You so could have back. deploy. Undeploy. Um, you could have undeploy. <laughs> <laughs> return. You, you could have return. You could have whatever you want, right? It doesn't really matter. Um, and the other ones would still work too. So having extras isn't a big deal. Oh, you can't have return. Returns required. Um, returns the keyword. Uh, undeploy. Uh, okay. So you could have that if you wanted to. Um, would not be super useful, but you could. Um, from there, what else would we need to tell it to do? So we have we have a subsystem built that has it. Where else do we need to modify stuff to add something like that? We have to have we would have to have a command. What else would we have to do? Um, we could do, uh, we we could do the command first if we want. Uh, I, I, usually do, I usually start up and set up subsystems Don't because we? when you need to do the command, you need to start referencing robot dot blah. Yeah, that, that's um, what I was thinking. Don't we? Yeah, but I was going to do robot. So we need to do it in robot, right? So like, we build that up. Uh, uh, so we come down here. We only put it down at the bottom, right? So we have a public static. Hopper hitter. What is this? Hopper, Hopper hitter. It. What is this? It. I don't know. Name Hop it. Hopper hitter. Hopper hitter. Hopper hitter. We clearly have a, a convention. Uh, I think it's Hopper hit with the hit being uppercase. Are you reading the Hopper convention? Hitter. Hopper hitter. Yeah. It's just Hopper hitter with <laughs> lowercase a. Yeah. Lowercase <laughs> Oh, sorry. <right. laughs> there is clearly a convention. <laughs> Um, all right, so it's red because it's mad. It's like, hey, I don't know what this is. Um, that's because we have not necessarily, we have to save Hopper Hitter, and then we have to come in here and do, click on this and do import Hopper Hitter, and it fixes our imports for us, so it comes up and adds a line oh, up really here. Does that? Oh, that it comes up and adds a line. Oh, that's really nice. I'm not mad. Um, all of these things, are, I mean, the yellow dots are ones we're not using anymore, so we don't need those. We can get rid of them. Um, and then we'll just add them back if we end up needing them. Um, I'm pretty sure Robot has preferences. Why is it not using preferences? Oh, because we have spectral preferences. That's right. We made our own. Um, okay. 
All right, so hopper hitter exists there. Where else does it need to get changed? Do you remember? You know, we also need to create. We need to actually like initialize it, right? Yeah. In, sub in set up subsystems? With all the other stolen lines, which is perfect. All right, so somewhere down here, um, we can put it near backpack, probably. Probably near shooter, maybe, because before backpack and after shooter. Um, All right, so we have to pass it a spectrum solenoid, so we'd make a spectrum solenoid. So we have to do spectrum solenoid, which is a, uh, we never talked about drivers, that's one of the things we never talked about. Um, driver? What's a driver? What's a driver? Uh, oh, all of our little... Uh, yeah, so like, there's certain hardware things that aren't like sub subsystems, they just tell us how we interact with hardware. Um, okay, so then, what is this? So we have to make a new spectrum solenoid for it, right? We have hopper hitter solenoid. What goes inside that? Uh, we need to give it a name. Or, let's go back to hopper hitter. Let's go back to hopper hitter? Yes, our, our solenoid, solenoid, spectrum solenoid. Okay, so spectrum solenoid, or solenoid subsystem, right? So solenoid subsystem, it has, or even a hopper hitter either way. So we know we have to pass it a spectrum solenoid and a, and a name. So then how do we make, so we're making a spectrum solenoid. So spectrum so solenoids need what? They need a we port need number. Yeah. So we need a port number. Okay. So we need to go to hardware. We yeah. need to make a new port number. There we go. So we go into hardware, and we not necessarily make a new port number. We just have to tell it where it is, right? So we have pneumatics here. We have 0 through 7. We'll take gear spear. Uh, yeah, we probably take gear spear. So instead of having gear spear, we would Hopper hitter or something like that. Okay. Uh, so then inside robot, we would do hardware dot, and it comes up, so it auto completes for us. So we hopper or something. So we don't have to All right. Uh, and then it's not happy. And it's not happy probably because I can't. Oh, because I forgot to give it a name. Uh, because. Uh, but I don't need to do that. So actually, what we should have done is inside hopper hitter, get rid of name, and pass name. on hopper hitter. Um, actually, no, this is actually reasonable. So there is a reason why we would keep name, which is we'd want this to be, we'd probably end up needing two because there's a left and a right. So this would be like hopper left. Um, it's still mad. I'm not entirely sure why. Probably because I can't spell for some reason. Oh, because so I'm being ridiculous. We're not into hopper here yet. Okay. This is spectrum solenoid. This is all correct. Then we do. We set up the subsystem, we put it in hardware, we have it in set up subsystems, and now we need to put it in all that exists. So now we have no way to, it exists now, but we have no way to do anything with it, so now we need so some command, right? So I'll make a new command. Um, Hit hop. So new class, which would be like deploy hopper hitter. Um, 
it has some classes that we don't care about, so we don't need to have, we don't care about the names. Uh, okay. So, we probably don't care about the timeout either on this, because it doesn't really matter. So, we probably don't so. that. Um, the example command has the stuff we need in it, which is why we keep it around. We're going to copy it all. It's three. It's two. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, right. So that's all there. Okay, so what goes where in here? So this is our command. What do we need it to actually do? We need to make an offer. So we need to extend. And we need to okay, where does it do what? We're going to, it's going to extend the additional ones. All right. And what do we say? Uh, the Do we set it as the ploy or? Yeah, we did. Oh, that's great. Come on, guys, help me. <laughs> help me out. <laughs> what are we acting on here? Like, what do what, what we type first? First things first. What do we just, we set up the subsystem, right? Yeah, we set up the subsystem. Okay. So, so how do we access that set to the system we just set up? Well, first we gotta import the system. Um, no. Well, yeah, that comes along with the... Um, yeah, like it'll do it by itself. Yeah, you're typing right there. Well, we're gonna need to, when it initializes, we're gonna want it to extend. Right, so how, but how do we tell it to extend? Uh, we do hop. So we do hop right here. But where is the hopper? Go call it. It's is the extent method the robot, right? Yeah. Oh, robot. so robot. Yeah, you have to be robot because you have to you have to get the instance of the hopper, right? So it's robot dot h, and then we have it, and then we can use the autocomplete to tell us what it is. It's deploy, deploy, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So now we have robot dot hopper header dot deploy. Um, does execute need to do anything? No. We only want to run once. Okay. So then, is, is finish need to do anything? Yeah. Yes, it needs to do something. What is this finish here? So first it needs to check when the gear on the support. So it would, would us, right? Well, that's an interesting case. It's more advanced than I was planning to do, but. Yeah, you would check if the gear is deployed when it's deployed you can do it is true, right? The gear? He's talking about the gear. Yeah. Oh, because oh, they, can't, the they can't oh, interfere with each other. Oh, oh, oh when, the, when the hopper is. Yeah, because when your hopper hitter hits, it's when it's fully deployed. It would hit, and then you would hit, and you would finish, and it would return true, and then it would run end. Um, probably not. We would tell it when to retract ourselves. Okay. Because we don't know that it actually has anything. Okay. Um, you have no feedback on that, right? The idea of having it retract if the gear arm gets extended is interesting, but that gets really tricky. Um, it's like a There's a lot of failure cases that that Oh, wait, why not? Couldn't you just, like, do all of this in drive to drive to wall and just have it extend at the start of drive to wall? And then yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm talking about, like, because in theory they shouldn't be out at the same time as the gear arm because it's illegal, like, you break sizing. That's, that's what I thought he was talking about. I would again. I wouldn't write this. Okay. He, he brought it up, and I was like, "Could you? Maybe I want it because it's just more complicated than it needs to be." Um, yeah, it's possible. I want it. I would leave it is false, and then we would just manually bring it back. Okay. End is um, robot dot hopper hitter dot retract. Either retract or undeploy. Undeploy. Either on the end. All right, and then interrupt. It has to be end, right? <laughs> Okay, so now we have a command. Now we gotta go with the line. Um, you have to. Um, or I could not spell some kind of way to pin. Save robot. Oh, so if you don't save stuff, it gets mad at you. Oh. Um, if you haven't saved the value, it doesn't know that it exists. Um, 
Um, so often you'll see something like give you an error. It's like you don't. This doesn't exist. You're like I just wrote it. And it's just because there's an asterisk on whatever the line it doesn't. It doesn't oh, that's when it's like oh asterisk. Oh, hmm? oh, the asterisk in the corner of the on the top tells you it's not safe. Right? That's what you just said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. If there's an asterisk, it's not safe. Um, you probably also need a retract topper hitter. Um, possibly, because it's you. One of those ones where you want to make sure. Just call hopper deploy hopper hitter dot cancel. Sure, but if you've just made a new one and you don't have it saved anywhere in an instance, you don't have a way to do that. Let me see. Why not? Let's write more. Um, I mean, in theory, you could start your own. You could start one and then immediately cancel it, and that would also do it. But that'd be weird. <laughs> Um, oh, one of the things we didn't do here, though, um, it should require oh, require hopper, uh, header, hopper which is in, where do you tell it where to require it? It's in the requirement, it just requires robot hopper. Nothing else should ever be using hopper header? What? Should anything else ever? No, but it still should require it, because clearly it needs to happen. You should. Um, so okay. you should just put requires in, even if there's. If if, yeah. if if nothing else should be running that subsystem at the same time, yeah. you should have requires in. Right. Uh, if something doesn't require that subsystem, does it do anything? If you just put in require, just no. All right. All right. So I'm going to copy and paste it and make a retract hopper hitter or undeploy oh, hopper hitter. Maybe. Will actually do anything useful instead of just freeze. Time to get the balance. Yes, that's what it's doing. Undeploy. Undeploy how for dinner. Probably ends without anything, so we don't need it. We don't want it to deploy. That'd be weird. <laughs> um, this one is, un is just true, right? So like, as, as soon as you call on deploy, it just completely it ends stop. it. Yeah, yeah. It, it pulls it back. It finishes, and then hopper hitter can call itself again if it wants to, or whatever. If you needed to use it, you may never need it. It can just sit there and be as unused. Thing. Okay, so then if we wanted to call it, we would have it at, uh, it would go inside the command group somewhere. So we have it in an autonomous command somewhere, probably in hopper own. Right, so we have uh, hopper auto. We would probably have it come out at the same time we'd lower the ball flaps 